Be sure to hear prime time. Fred had a boy violinist on the show. He was 10 years old, and he played the B. And when he got through with the number, he said to him, he asked his boy, said, how old are you? And the boy says, 10. He says, 10 years old, and you played the B so well. He says, Jack Benny ought to be ashamed of himself. And that's all he said. And he probably said that, knowing that I was listening to his show, just to make me laugh. So on the next show, on my show, at the very tag of the show, the thing we call the tag, I said to Mary, and this was merely to make Fred laugh. I said, Mary, take this. I'm going to dictate a message to Fred Allen. I want you to mail it for me. Say, dear Fred, when I was 10 years old, I could play the B2. Well, the next week, Fred had some stooges on who were supposed to have known me in Waukegan, Illinois, to prove that I couldn't play the B when I was 10 years old. The following week on my show, I brought people on from Waukegan who said I could play the B when I was 10 years old. And before we knew it, we were into the darndest feud you have ever seen, which was very funny. And the strange part of it is, I can safely say from six to eight months with this feud before we even called each other on the phone about it. Hello out there in Radio Land. We invite you to reminisce for a while this afternoon as we present Those Were the Days, brought to you with fond memories by Northwest Federal Savings and Loan Association, by Nelson Hirschberg Ford, and by Eden's Plaza Shopping Center. This is Chuck Shaden with another in our series of programs designed to bridge the sound gap between yesterday and today. Today is Saturday, September 10th, 1977. And today on Those Were the Days, we present Jack Benny and Fred Allen, superstars. Between now and 5 o'clock this afternoon, we'll have a spectacular array of radio comedy starring two of the friendliest, feudingest personalities from the golden age of radio. You'll hear excerpts and complete programs starring Jack Benny and Fred Allen and all of their cast members in what should be a great overview of their famous feud. Now, you won't want to miss a minute of our program today, gang, so stick close to your good old radio. The fun begins right after this word from Northwest Federal Savings. Skyscrapers, sprawling splits that drive you bananas, sundaes topped with irresistible chocolate and cherries. But no matter how tip-top they seem, Northwest Federal Savings would like to remind you that great ice cream creations don't start at the top. They all begin at the bottom. And you can get 12 great bottoms in a complete 13-piece set of old-fashioned glass fountainware. It's free when you deposit $1,000 at Northwest Federal, or just $3 with a $250 deposit. There are four big banana split boats, four Sunday goblets, four big soda glasses, and a super ice cream scoop or two. Pick up your fountainware at any Northwest Federal Savings Center now through September 10th. Limit one per family. Fountainware from Northwest Federal. This could be the start of something big. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. And this is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program here on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. Our uh, ice cream fountainware promotion at Northwest Federal ends today. And uh, you may want to zip over there, uh, Toot Sweet, to get something for your sweet tooth. And... <laughs> We have a good afternoon of good radio for you, too. And tonight, we resume our Memory Club movies. Yes, indeed, this is the, this is the premiere of the fall season for the Memory Club. This is, a, this is like a premiere, like a fall season for us, too, I guess. Uh, everything seems to take a new shape after Labor Day is over, and uh, kids are all back in school now, and uh, all the television shows are premiering for the new season in the week ahead. There's a bit of fall in the air. Football season is underway, and uh, so we kind of look at this as a new season for us, too, on the, uh, on the old Nostalgia Network here. We have um, a great uh, month, uh, several many months, many years, we hope, of uh, good old radio shows ahead of us, 
and of course the memory club season and it kicks off this evening and we have something very very good for you tonight on the screen in the memory club it's uh, jack benny and fred allen uh, appropriately planned to coincide with our afternoon today on the screen from 1940 in love thy neighbor carrying their famous radio feud onto the screen now the memory club is held in the community room at northwest federal savings and loan association over at 4901 west irving park road in chicago there's plenty of free parking in the large lot at the rear of the office on Dakin Street, or you can get there by simply taking CTA transportation, which will drop you off right at the door. Our movie begins at 8 o'clock, and the doors will open at 7.30. Dues are a dollar and a quarter a meeting. We will be there, and we hope that you will be there, too, for a brand new season of good old movies. Tonight, the Memory Club premiere for the new season, Love Thy Neighbor from 1940 with Jack Benny and Fred Allen. Jack Benny and Fred Allen, I'm sure, were very good friends. Indeed, I know they were very good friends. And uh, we have for you a, a beautiful afternoon of great comedy with those two master wits of radio. And uh, we're going to get a good look at the feud, the Jack Benny-Fred Allen feud. This is about how it all began. This is an interesting little clip that runs about five minutes, and I think you'll find it very interesting. A little bit of how it began jack benny himself reminiscing a bit and then uh, uh, jack benny and fred allen on stage before a live vaudeville audience listen to this hello again this is jack benny the lone wolf talking <laughs> hmm, can't get a date i can have a date every night in the week if i want to oh i didn't mean anything jack i just wanted to start out with a laugh that's all well there's very little humor getting laughs at other people's expense and that reminds me uh, come here a minute don did you, uh, did you hear Fred Allen last Wednesday night? <laughs> oh, sure. It was a swell program. It was really great. Don't review it, Don. Just answer yes or no. <laughs> did you hear Allen make those innuendos? You know, those slurring remarks about my violin playing? Yes, yes, I did. Pretty catty, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, I don't know. He was just kidding, and you're taking it seriously. Well, so would Heifetz or any other musician. <laughs> Well, as I live and breathe and stand under a strong light so people won't mistake the wrinkles in my face for a washboard, oh, 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 if it ain't Portland. I mean, Mary. <laughs> Hope he heard that. What's the matter with you, Jack? Plenty. Did you hear Fred Allen Wednesday? Yeah. Gee, that was a funny program. Yeah. What laughs? Wow! Don't elaborate, you little traitor. <laughs> the way he talked about my violin playing, I ought to sue him. You ought to sue your teacher, too. Is that so? Madden saying that I couldn't play Flight of the Bumblebee at the age of 10. I played Flight of the Bumblebee so often, I got the hive. <laughs> I bet you stung up the whole town with it. This, I actually remember, started the feud, because the feud started the week before when a little 10-year-old boy played the violin. And when he got through, Fred, knowing that I always listened to his radio show, he made some derogatory remark. He said, to think that a boy 10 years old can play the violin like that, Jack Benny ought to be ashamed of himself. And I jumped on it. And then he picked it on from there. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Look, they want me to play Love no, and Bloom. No, they don't want you. They want you not to play Love and Bloom. <laughs> Mr. Benny killed Vaudeville. Today, the murderer returns to the scene of his crime. I have the ad right here in the paper, Mr. Benny. It says, the biggest show in town, 14 days only, due to Mr. Benny's prior commitment. <laughs> You have to put it in there, you're going back with the good humor people. I mean, you have to put it in there. It says... I... It says the biggest show in New York, yeah. you will die laughing. Yeah. Now, the show is over, and I'm still alive. <laughs> I would like to have my money back. I would like to have my money back. 
Patrick. I really, I Look, paid Fred, 80 I'm cents. sorry. You paid 80, 80 cents. cents. If you want your money back, you'll have to go to the box office. They I'm told sorry. me at the box office you're taking it out after every show. I should... They told me I should come to you direct. They now, did. wait a minute. 80 cents. The show eight, cost 80, 80 cents. cents. Now, look what you got for 80 cents. You got the Sportsman Quartet, Marjorie Reynolds, yeah. Rochester, Phil Harris, and myself. Now, you did like the Sportsman Quartet. Very good, very good. Is that worth 15 cents? 15 cents of anybody's money. Four for 15. That's right. Is good. Okay. Four for 15. Marjorie Reynolds, is that worth a quarter? Marjorie Reynolds? Uh, let me see. You drive a hard bargain. <laughs> <laughs> A quarter, yes, I, I'll, 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 40 cents. 40 cents. I'll, I'll give him 40 cents. <laughs> 40 cents. 40 cents. All right, that's 40 cents. Now, Phil. Now, Rochester. Rochester, very good. Excellent. That's certainly worth 20 cents, isn't it? Yes, yes, 20 cents. That's 60 cents. 60 cents. Okay. All right. The first, now, Phil Harris is worth a dime, is that right? Eight cents. Okay. All right. All right. Eight cents. All right. That's 68, 68 cents. cents. That leaves you 12 cents. 12 cents. I would like to have 12 cents. Look, and remember, this is my last quarter that I got with me. I didn't get paid yet. I got to have dinner. I got to have a sandwich. I got to have nice. something to eat. You're in here all I got day. It. I'm going to be here uh, all day. That's I haven't even got money to ride home, not even tonight? on the bus. Nothing, you nothing. Home no. tonight? Well, how are you going to get home? Would you I don't know. You'll give away about 9 o'clock. You'll never be able that's to walk it. it. Well, if you could just let me have a dime so I could get back on the bus. the bus. That's right. Jack Benny and uh, Fred Allen there on stage in New York uh, in a rare, rare uh, vaudeville appearance. I don't know exactly when that was. Uh, you may have seen a large excerpt of that sometime on television, uh, only because apparently the newsreel companies... Uh, uh, Possibly uh, Fox Movie Tone News, uh, or one of them at any rate, was covering that, and they just let the cameras roll, and they had the whole thing, and that that little piece of sound there comes from a newsreel soundtrack, with the uh, Jack Benny and Fred Allen there, uh, sometime I presume uh, in the 1940s on stage uh, in New York City, doing possibly five or six a day. Uh, in between the movies. Would you like to have been at the theater there to see that? What a fantastic combination it would have been with Jack Benny and Fred Allen. The best of friends, though they carried out the best of feuds uh, over the years uh, on on radio. Uh, Jack would use his program to uh, needle Fred Allen, and uh, Fred Allen would use his program to needle Jack. In uh, 1938, on the 25th of March, uh, Fred Allen and company does just that in this little excerpt from the Town Hall Tonight program. Now on Sunday morning here at the Town Hall, the Hay Fever Guild will meet for pollen drill. Mr. And Allen! Mr. Now quiet, uh-uh, the acoustics bruise easily here. I may have to dab some minute rub on the walls if these the acoustics sort of... Uh, uh, hello? <laughs> Well, sir, they laughed when I said the magician's hair was coming out. They didn't know I was going to pull his rabbit out of the hat. <laughs> if it is, if it isn't, <laughs> well, you have to make faces with a joke like that, just you. <laughs> A poor old joke like that, you drag it out, you have to help it as much you, as you can. <laughs> what I really should do is hide that monkey on me and let it out at <laughs> rare, on rare occasion. Well, if it isn't, what's her name? Yes, Mama sent me out to get a golf club. Well, don't tell me your mother's taking up that rollicking game of meadow badminton. <laughs> no, but our baby swallowed a golf ball. A golf ball? And your mother is... Uh, uh, Mama's going to spank it with a niblick. Well, you'd, uh, you'd better get right home and caddy for your mother. The baby might turn out to be a tough course, you know. <laughs> Hello, Portland. Uh, pardon me, but uh, I never speak to strange men at microphones. Portland, this is Andre Barouche. Andre's taking Harry Von Zell's place, remember? Oh, yes. Hello, Andre. Gosh, you were swell last week. Yes, yes. Well, thank you, Portland. Hello, fans. 
<laughs> Hello, Peter. Optimist in the plural, yeah. <laughs> not, uh, not stuff Van Steeden. It isn't Benny Goodman. <laughs> well, you could be with the top of your head going into that big apple. Be careful. You know what you got from Jack Benny Sunday night. <laughs> and did I laugh when Jack beat Mr. Allen up on his program? <laughs> See, I nearly passed out when Fred started crying. Yeah? <laughs> when I started crying, I uh, dubbed in a, a cry for me. <laughs> How did Benny beat me up? In effigy. And at that, he had to make me a little boy in his sketch before he could do it. Ah, <laughs> yeah. uh, you yeah. can't take it even as a kid. Well, Benny better not start anything with me, or Jell-O's going to have eight delicious flavors. <laughs> what eight, Fred? <laughs> what? I said, what eight? Well, I'll just strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, lime, and black and blue. <laughs> You shouldn't fight with Jack now. He's pretty weak going on that yeah, he's diet. He's always weak. Say, I wonder why Paramount made Jack cut down on his food. Well, he's making the picture for his room and board. And Paramount caught him overdoing the latter. <laughs> why, they tell me a waiter walked into the commissary one day with 15 meatballs, and Benny ran pool before the waiter could set down the plate. <laughs> Benny's better in pictures than you are for my money. Oh, yes? Who won the Academy Award last year? Spencer Tracy. And I know Spencer Tracy better than Benny does. <laughs> so what does that prove? It proves that if Benny keeps making pictures, he's going to make fresh air fiends out of a lot of theater goers. You can say what you want, but I thought Jack was well, as Tom Sawyer, Sunday. Tom Sawyer. He played the part like one of the Finn boys. Huckleberry? No, Mickey. <laughs> Feeding me up as a kid. Why, I could have met him in a day nursery and licked him with open safety pins at ten paces. That, of course, is Fred Allen giving a good zinger there to Jack Benny back on his Town Hall Tonight program, March 25th of 1938 with uh, Portland Hoffa, Peter Van Steeden, and Andre Baruch. Um, this is going to be an afternoon filled with zingers and shots from uh, two of the masters, uh, Jack Benny and Fred Allen, as we have a, a wonderful program of uh, great sounds from those two master comedians. A lot of good things coming up. And, of course, uh, Fred was talking about Jack Benny's movie career. Fred Allen had a bit of a movie career, too. And uh, in 1940, the two of them made a picture together called Love Thy Neighbor. It's going to be on the screen in the Memory Club tonight. I want to keep reminding you of that because we'd like to have you join us for our, uh, our premiere program as it begins this evening uh, over in the community room at Northwest Federal Savings. Here's a reminder to kick up your heels and drag yourself over to Nelson Hirschberg Ford's Roaring 70s Clearance Sale. A good supply of 1977 Fords are on hand, but they'll skidoo in a hurry at special clearance prices. The 78s will be raiding the Nelson Hirschberg showroom soon, and the Ford team is making deals to roar about on all 77s in stock. You'll get easy clearance prices on dependable Maverick, luxurious LTDs, LTD wagons, and the Great Granada. Skedaddle over to Nelson Hirschberg Ford, 5133 West Irving Park Road. Do it now with our still enough 77s to go around. Open Monday through Friday until 9, Saturday and Sunday till 5. Nelson Hirschberg Ford, 5133 West Irving Park Road at Laramie. Get your new Ford from an old-fashioned dealer during Nelson Hirschberg's Roaring 70s clearance. And we will roar back now into some good old sounds with Fred and Jack. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. We're going to go back now to January 15th of 1950. You know, we could uh, do some research and tell you how Jack Benny met Fred Allen or uh, how Fred met Jack, obviously how they met each other. But we thought this little excerpt, uh, about uh, almost eight minutes, seven minutes and 50 seconds, this little excerpt from the Jack Benny program of that date uh, featuring both Jack and Fred, uh, gives you uh, their versions of how they met each other from January 15th of 1950. Now, look, kids, I've made up my mind. If Alan doesn't get here for rehearsal in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to cancel him. I wonder where he can be. He hasn't any friends out here. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Will it be any 
anything else, Mr. Allen? Uh, yes, waiter. I'll have another cup of coffee. Well, they're about the same, except we have a water shortage, you know. Oh, yeah, I've been reading about that. Did it affect you personally? Well, it didn't bother me much at first, but after several weeks, something told me to take a bath. <laughs> I don't know yet, but my lawyer filed suit against him two weeks ago. <laughs> well, wait a minute. You ain't even been on his program yet, and you started suing him two weeks ago? My friend, when you deal with Benny, it's always best to get a running start. <laughs> you mean he's really that cheap? Cheap? Why, Benny is so tight that last summer when he was out on a dude ranch, he kept his money in a wildcat's mouth. <laughs> He was snide enough to find a wildcat with tonsillitis so it couldn't swallow. <laughs> well, I, uh, I'd better get going. I, I have to go to that old man's rehearsal over there. Say, uh, which network is he lousing up now? <laughs> oh, he's at CBS. It's just two blocks from here. Say, on second thought, you know, I think I'll let him stew a little while. Bring me another cup of coffee. <laughs> I can't understand what's keeping Fred. Oh, Jack, take it easy. He'll be here any minute. Well, when we go to court, I'm certainly going to bring up about him being late. <laughs> oh, Rochester, will you run out and see if you can find Mr. Allen? Maybe he's at Lyman's or at the Derby. Somewhere. Yes, sir. See, that Allen is certainly a thoughtless guy. He's been doing things like this to me since the first day I met him. Jack, I've been with you for so many years, and I never knew how you first met Fred Allen. Oh, it happened in Boston a long time ago. Well, tell me about it, Jack. All right, Don. It was many, many years ago when Vaudeville was at its height. I was the headliner at the Metropolitan Theater in Boston. One night after the supper show, I was sitting in my dressing room resting from my seven encores. I was removing my makeup. Come in. Uh, Mr. Benny? Yes? Uh, Mr. Benny, my name is Fred Allen. Uh-huh. I'm appearing here at the uh, Metropolitan. Well, that's funny. I don't remember any Fred Allen on this bill. I'm in the opening act. Oh, I thought the opening act was Pink's Mule. I took my makeup off, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're with Pink's Mule? Uh-huh. May I sit down? Yes, but not too close. <laughs> Now, what, uh, what can I do for you, young man? Tell me, Mr. Benny, what do you think of this new entertainment medium that's just starting up, this thing called radio? Well, I've been giving it a lot of thought. In fact, I already have an idea for a radio program. You have? Yes. On my program each week, I'll visit a place called Benny's Boulevard, where I'll start knocking on doors and ask topical questions of four people. Four people? Yes, a southern senator, a rube who says howdy, bub, oh. a Bronx housewife, and an Irishman. Gosh, what a novel idea for radio. You know, that might even replace the street singer. <laughs> yes, you'll have to excuse me now, Alan. I've got to get dressed for dinner. Well, goodbye, Mr. Benny, and thank you so much, sir, for your help. I will always treasure the memory of this meeting, meeting the greatest comedian in the world, sir. I'm backing out, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and that, Don, is how I first met Fred Allen and why I dislike him so much. Jack, you mean... Yes, he stole my radio idea and called it Allen's Alley. See, I wonder if Rochester has found him yet. Say, waiter, I'll have another... Call. Oh, there you are, Mr. Allen. I've been looking all over for you. Oh, hello, Rochester. Say, I was just getting ready to go over to the studio. Well, let's hurry, Mr. Benny's awful upset. Come on, I'll show you the shortcut to CBS. Good. After all these years, Rochester, you'd think Benny would change. But he's just as bad as when I first met him in Boston many years ago. 
I never did hear about how you two first met. Uh, would you tell me about it, Mr. Allen? I was headlining at the Metropolitan Theater in Boston. And one evening after the supper show, I was sitting in my dressing room removing my makeup. Come in. Uh, Mr. Allen? Yes? Uh, my name is Jack Benny. Well, I'm glad you got here. It's the cold water faucet that's leaking. <laughs> I'm not the plumber. See, I'm appearing here on the vaudeville bill with you. Jack, Benny, Jack. Say, I, did, I didn't see your name on the program. Oh, I'm in the opening act. But the show opens with a Japanese flash act. Yamaguchi and Takamura. Gosh, they're wonderful. The way they lie on their backs and juggle that big barrel with their feet. I know. And inside of that barrel, me. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, yes, Mr. Allen. While they're balancing that barrel and kicking it up in the air, I'm curled up inside with my violin, playing Ireland Must Be Heaven, because my mother came from there. <laughs> what an inspired touch. I can just hear that music coming out through the bunghole. So much for flattery. Now, what can I do? <laughs> what can I do for you, son? <laughs> Mr. Allen, sir, yeah. you've got to help me. I want to be a great comedian like you. Well, if you're so anxious to earn big money, why don't you turn to radio? Radio? Yes, it's a gold mine. Say, I'm working on an idea for a program for myself. Now, my idea is this. I'll be the star, you see. A girl to insult me, a drunken orchestra leader, and a fat announcer. Well, here's the studio, Mr. Allen. Let's go in. No. No, Rochester. I can't go in. What? I can't do it, Rochester. I can't let Benny give me a job. I may be a derelict down and out, but I've still got my pride. But, Mr. Allen... No, I'm sorry, Rochester. I just can't do it. But, Mr. Allen, you haven't got any money. How are you going to live? Don't worry about me. I'll get along. Maps! Get your maps to the movie star. Oh, James Mason, Ronald Coleman, Mr. and Mrs. Gary Cooper, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Taylor. You can't tell me. The familiar theme music of the Jack Benny program there, and that is uh, Benny's show from January 15th of 1950. Uh, a short excerpt from that broadcast with Fred Allen, each giving their uh, version of uh, uh, how they met. Two great comedians. Uh, Fred Allen uh, lived until uh, 1956. Jack Benny died uh, in 1970. Gee, now I'm trying to remember when it was. A couple years ago now, wasn't it? 70. This is 77. Must have been 75. I'll have to check that out. That's terrible that I don't know that off the top of my head, but we'll find out for sure on that. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. We have loads of Jack Benny and Fred Allen programs this afternoon, a lot of excerpts and some complete shows. We'll be listening into a complete Fred Allen show in just a little bit from 1949. A little later on, we have a complete uh, Jack Benny program from 1946. And in between and all around that, some classic confrontations uh, from some command performance broadcasts, from a camel comedy caravan, even from the big show. Uh, at about the time, uh, shortly after, at any rate, uh, of this Benny program that we just heard, the little excerpt, um, Fred Allen was a regular on the big show, which uh, starred Tallulah Bankhead, uh, radio's last-ditch uh, effort at uh, providing live variety entertainment uh, once a week. They did a 90-minute show on Sundays, and Fred was a regular on that show, but it was not his show. Um, his Actually, his last show... Of, uh, of all time is the one we're going to be hearing in just a couple of minutes, his uh, very last program with Henry Morgan and, of course, his guest, uh, Jack uh, Benny. Are those with the day's program? We'll continue in just a bit. <clears throat> I want to remind you about um, Riverview. Well, Riverview is gone, but it's not forgotten. But Chuck Voldarsik, a friend of ours who has uh, made a uh, number of uh, guest appearances on our program uh, and who indeed has been at our memory club with some... Uh, uh, Riverview Nights and was uh, responsible with us for the, the giant night of nostalgia at Riverview Park uh, last spring. 
He's written a book now, and it is available. It's called Riverview, 1904 to 1967, Gone But Not Forgotten. It's the story of the world's largest amusement park, over 100 pages. It's a great big 8.5 by 11 paperback book. You find hundreds of photos, pictures of tickets, blueprints for park rides, memories of the 64 years of Riverview Park. It's a photo history that will bring to you the good old days of Riverview. It sells for $9.95, and you can get it at our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road in Chicago. We're open uh, right now. We're open Saturdays from 10 till 7.30. We'll be open tomorrow from 12 to 5, and then Monday through Fridays we're open from 11 to 5.30. Chuck Voldarsik, by the way, will have copies of his book, the Riverview book, at our memory club tonight. And he will be there, and if you want to pick up your copy, you can get an autographed copy from Chuck tonight at the Memory Club, or tomorrow afternoon he'll be at our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941. Chuck will be there, so will I, as a matter of fact, be there tomorrow afternoon. If you'd like to stop by and get uh, an autographed copy of the Riverview History Book, uh, you can get that exclusively at our Metro Golden Memory Shop. It's $9.95. I recommend the book. If you've got any feeling at all for the golden age of Riverview, you've got to have this book with a beautiful color photograph on the cover and loads and loads of pictures inside. You can get it uh, tonight at the uh, Memory Club, tomorrow afternoon at the Metro Golden Memory Shop, anytime at the MGM Shop. But tonight, uh, Chuck Voldarsik, the author, will be on hand at the Memory Club to say hello and to autograph copies of the book, and he will be at our MGM shop tomorrow afternoon as well. So I hope that maybe you can pop in either tonight or tomorrow afternoon or sometime uh, to get your copy of the, uh, the great photo history book on uh, Riverview, our Metro Golden Memories special for today. Now, uh, uh, about 19 people must have called in the last minute and a half to remind me that Jack Benny died on December 26th of 1974. Okay, December 26th, 1974. Jack Benny, um, rather, Fred Allen, died on March 17, 1956. So uh, they're both gone, but uh, what a legacy they leave us. They're great talents on these, uh, these recordings that we're sharing with you today, and in films, too and in some of their television things. Uh, though Fred didn't do much on television, Jack Benny, of course, uh, came into television with a vengeance and provided us with many, many great uh, programs. This is a great radio show. This is the Fred Allen Show coming up now on uh, WNIB Chicago at FM 97. This is Fred's last regular program. Uh, he was at this time sponsored by the Ford Motor Company. The broadcast date is June 26th of 1949. In the show, a little later on, Jack Benny will turn up. Uh, Henry Morgan is a regular, uh, or is a guest, I should say, on this particular program. After Fred went off the air with this series, he was to return, as I said earlier, as uh, a regular on the big show, but it was not his program. He had a little segment, uh, regularly irregular, I might say. From now, from June 26th of 1949, The Fred Allen Show. Dealers of America present the Fred Allen Show. The Fred Allen Show with Fred's guests Jack Benny and Henry Morgan, Fortland Hoffa, Minerva Pius, Peter Donald, Parker Finley, the DeMarco sisters, and Al Goodman and his orchestra. And this is Kenny Delmar speaking for your friendly Ford dealer. Now that summer is here, every single one of the more than 6,400 Ford dealers would like to get his hands on every car that's going around with unsafe brakes, tires, or lights, and give it a good going over. Your Ford dealer would like to get his hands on your car to put it in shape for safe family driving. So bring it in tomorrow, why don't you? His expert service will be a revelation that saves so much time, trouble, and money. And your Ford will be a lot more fun to drive when Ford trained mechanics using special Ford equipment have gone over it by factory-approved methods. Give your car a new lease on life. You'll be surprised how little it costs when you take your car to the man who knows Ford's best, your friendly Ford dealer. Well, it's Sunday night again, and here comes Fred Allen and his new Ford to keep his weekly date at the corner of Main Street. As Fred steps out of his Ford, he hears a voice say, Mr. Allen! Ford! 
Lane. Portland, have you been waiting long? Oh, I've been looking at the pictures outside the newsreel theater. Oh, really? What's new in the newsreels this week? The Gregory Pecks had another boy. Yeah? They had three boys now. Three little Pecks, eh? <laughs> One more Peck, and they'll have a bushel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is that? What is that? What is well, I'd like to start things off with a laugh. With a laugh, huh? <laughs> It would be better if you started things off with a joke, you know. It would help you more. Oh, a joke? Yes. As the envelope said to the postage stamp, stick to me and we'll go places. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> now, look. Look, wait a minute. Tell well, me. I'm as hot as last Wednesday. You are as hot as any corner of an ice cube. <laughs> <laughs> if I can keep up this pace, I'll end up with my own program. Yes, you will. The way radio is going, <laughs> that is quite possible. If you... <laughs> Tell me, what uh, what else is in the news? Milton Girl has a newspaper column. Oh, I have seen that. I read it from right to left. You know, they have it in the paper. Where you do it. <laughs> know he's a columnist. I know. Burl walks around Lindy's on his knees so that people will think he's Billy Rose. I mean, <laughs> Milton went out to Hollywood to make a picture for Warner Brothers. Yes, I saw that, too. He's, it's going to take three weeks after the picture's made. He has to pop his own corn to go with the picture. <laughs> <laughs> when Burl's picture plays the Strand, it will pack the street. <laughs> well... About Mr. Television, Burl is the only comedian I know who uses an airwick for a straight man. <laughs> Say, I just happened to think you told me to remind you about Jack Eigen. Oh yes, Jack Eigen. Tonight, tonight will be the last time Jack Eigen's name will ever be mentioned on our program. Are you going to bid him farewell? Yes, Portland, I am. Let us bow our heads, sister, and face. <laughs> face the Copacabana. <laughs> As for the last time we mention his name, Jack Eigen. <laughs> well, well, Portland, there's nothing more to say. I think I'll pick out my paper. May I come along? Sure, let's take a walk down Main Street. <laughs> Say, here's an ad for that radio program I'm going to be on tomorrow night. Oh, DuPont's Cavalcade of America, The Life of Sue Chan. You know, he owns the House of Chan, and I'm going to interview him on the program. It'll be very interesting, my dialect and his blending that way. It'll come out... <laughs> Say, here's, a, here's an item. Look at this. Uh, as the first day of summer arrived this past week, millions of Americans started planning their vacation. Do you think most people really plan their vacation? Who knows? Let's ask some people as we're walking down Main Street. This man coming along with the live frogs on his smoking jacket. <laughs> Pardon me, sir. Why don't say Claghorn's a name Senator Claghorn, that is? Well, Senator... If you're telling Ford, take no gypsy to me. <laughs> but, uh... now, don't hold me up, son. I'm busy than a man with St. Vitus dance trying to put on his long underwear. <laughs> you're busy? Yeah, I'm heading a committee in Washington to track down them five percenters. Oh, the five percenters. Have you trapped any of those uh, five percenters, Senator? Well, I got my eye on one little wasp. Yeah. He's got a second-hand hearing device. He's still pretty deep. And uh, he's a five percenter? Yeah, the Navy ordered 200 boats. 200 boats. This little deep scissor bill thought to said goats. You mean the Navy ended up with 200 goats? With them goats loose in the Navy, son, today it ain't safe to be a rear admiral. <laughs> You sure have plenty of problems, Senator. Yeah, I'm keeping my eye on them red investigations. Say, do you think, confidentially, Senator, do you think communism is spreading, do you? It sure is, son. Them communists are heading for plenty of trouble. Trouble? Russia's taking over China. Where does the trouble come in? Them Russians are bringing borscht into China. Borscht? Son, when a Chinaman tries to lift that wet potato out of his borscht with chopsticks, there's going to be trouble. <laughs> Tell me, 
me, Senator, do you think most people plan their vacations? Americans have been planning the same vacations for generations. Really? Everybody in America finally gets to Europe. Finally gets to Europe. Eh? Every year, our civilians go over there for pleasure. Every year? And every 20 years, our army goes over there on business. Go <laughs> on. Portland, come away from that jewelry store window. I just learned something. Really? The diamond is the hardest mineral in the world. Well, why is the diamond the hardest mineral? It'll make an impression on a woman. Say, that's real good, isn't it? <laughs> Look who's coming out of Howard Johnson's with the ice cream cone. Oh. Titus Moody. Oh, hi, Mr. Moody. Moody, Bob. <laughs> Mr. Moody. Mr. Moody, do you think most people plan their summer vacations? Why, it seems to me everybody spends their summers driving around in automobiles. You are in a position to know this? I'd say so. You would, really? Yeah. I, I run a roadside stand for motorists. Really? What do you sell? My sign says, genuine farm eggs, strictly fresh. Well, how many chickens do you have? I don't have none. <laughs> well, with no... With no chickens, how can you run an egg business? Every morning I buy a lot of eggs at the A&P supermarket. <laughs> at the A&P? I set the eggs out on my roadside stand in nests. I see. Then I dress up as a rube. You dress up? I, I put on a big straw hat, yeah. tie a red bandana around my neck, stick a straw in my mouth, and then I go down by the road and I lean on a long rake. Well, what happens when a motorist drives up to your stand? Well, I start yelling, well, I swan, by heck, and <laughs> other rustic expressions. <laughs> so, the motorist, he thinks he's dealing with a country jay, a pea picker. A pea picker, eh? Hey? Uh, he says, he says, how about it, Zeke? Are them eggs fresh? Yeah. And with that, Miss Moody, she's under the counter meditating. She yeah. starts clucking. She clucks. <laughs> and the motorist buys the eggs? I ain't missed a sale in 20 years. Well, <laughs> how many eggs do you sell? Well, I can only sell 60 eggs an hour. Well, why only 60 eggs an hour? There's one born every minute. So long, but... So long. Portland, let's cross over here. Look who's turning the corner. Mrs. Nussbaum. Mrs. Nussbaum, do you think most people plan their vacations? Not me. In the summer, it's too hot for taking vacations. Too hot, you say? Last year at Far Rockaway, my little puppy, a water spaniel, is percolating to death. Oh. <laughs> you lost your dog? Well, what did you do? To my puppy, I'm dedicating a poem. Oh, really? What is it called? A puppy on a hot day I wouldn't want to be. Yeah, uh, it's a little dog girl, hey? Well, how, uh, <laughs> how does it go? A puppy on a hot day I wouldn't want to be. A puppy on a hot day could be someone else, not me. A herring on a hot day I would be, likewise a guppy. But one thing I would hate to be on a hot day is a puppy. <laughs> a puppy on a hot day can wag his tail a minute. This will stir a breeze behind, but the puppy isn't in it. <laughs> For a puppy, I feel sorry. On a hot day, he will pant. I can take my coat off, but a little puppy can. <laughs> Good night, Mrs. Nussbaum. Well, Portland, walking down Main Street is like reading a dull book. It's good to come to the end. You haven't found out anything about people plotting their vacations, have you? Well, I tell you, I'll try one more passerby. This little man coming along with the horseshoe crab for a tie pin. <laughs> Hi, chum. <laughs> Uh -huh. Stand aside, me boy. I'm celebrating. You're celebrating what? Sure, the drought is over. The beer strike ended. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look as though you've been making up for lost time. Yeah, I, I think I drank too much beer. Really? Why? Every time I perspire, me perspiration has a head on it. <laughs> 
Well, tell me, Ajax, do you think people plan their vacations? Well, no, me boy, I don't plan nothing. I have the same vacation every summer. You do? To get away from the humdrum routine, the grind of doing nothing all year. Yes. For me vacation? Yes. I go to work for two weeks. Come on, you boy. So long, Ajax. Let's go, Portland. I'll be late for my date at the music store. You have a date? Oh, say, is this a big night tonight? You know, one of the DeMarco sisters, Anne DeMarco, has written a song. Now, Al Goodman and his orchestra and the DeMarco sisters are going to do Anne's song for the first time on the air tonight. It's called Time Doesn't Change a Thing. <laughs> Portland, this is the last time we'll ever walk down Main Street. Let's stop in and say goodbye to the Ford dealer. All right. He's standing inside the door. That's well. Well, Fred and Portland, this is a surprise. This is our last program. We want to say goodbye. Yes, Portland and I want to tell you and all the Ford dealers how wonderful it has been to work for you these past two years. Thank you, Fred. Uh, what are you in Portland going to do this summer? Well, part of the summer, we're going to drive around in our new Ford. Yes, we may sell some cars for you now while we're out on the road this summer. You don't have to sell Ford, Fred. No. The new Ford sells itself. The new Ford is the only car in its class with a V8 engine. The only one with 100 horsepower. Say, I've heard Kenny say that on the program. Kenny said the V8 is the type of engine used in America's costliest car. That's right. Yet a Ford with a V8 engine costs hundreds of dollars less than many other cars with six-cylinder engines. The Ford has more power for the weight the engine has to move than any other car on the road. And Kenny always talks about the new Ford feel. Yes, Fred, other features that contribute to the new Ford feel are the solid lifeguard body of heavy-gauge steel, the magic action brakes that are 35% easier to apply, and new springs, hydrocoil in the front, paraflex in the rear. Oh, Mama says... The new Ford is the fashion car of the year. That's true, Portland. The new Ford received the 1949 award from the New York Fashion Academy. Say, on the program, too, Kenny says the Ford is a big car. Yes, the new Ford has more hip room. And can Mama use that hip room? Yeah. <laughs> it has more shoulder room than any other car in its field. And big picture windows all around. Oh, Mama likes big windows. She can see what everybody's doing. Mama's nosy. Say, well, this, this is all mighty interesting, hearing about all the features of the new Ford. But, Portland, I think we'd better leave. Well, why, Fred? You bought a new Ford, didn't you? Yes, but if you keep talking, I'll buy another one. Come on, Portland. Happy vacation, kids. Thanks. Goodbye. 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 There they are. Vacation and uh, the end of Fred's uh, regular uh, career on radio as a regular. Uh, on his own show. Started back in the middle 1930s with the uh, uh, the Salad Bowl Review. 
This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program this afternoon, reviewing the careers on radio of Jack Benny and Fred Allen, the great radio uh, feud, the fight of the century, if you would have it, on, on the air. We have more of this program with um, Henry Morgan and Jack Benny uh, popping up in uh, just a little bit. This is uh, WNIB Chicago at FM 97. Frigidaire Appliances, TV by Sony, Magnavox, and Quasar. Stereos by Sony and Magnavox. Corning Electric Ranges, Crown and Hardwick Gas Ranges. Shop no further. Townhouse TV and Appliances has them all. Visit Townhouse and you'll be surprised at the selection and at the price. And that's not all. You'll get the Townhouse Guarantee. Guaranteed delivery on the day promised. Guaranteed normal installation on all products delivered. Removal of your old appliance to the basement, to the garage, or off the premises. And Townhouse also guarantees to remove all cartons and packing material as well. Townhouse means service. You'll get it at 7243 Tui Avenue, just west of Harlem. Townhouse TV and Appliances, open Monday, Thursday, and Friday nights till 9, Saturday until 5. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Womat. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where convenience is important, and so are you. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Back to school values, seven days a week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center in Wilmette. Now let's get back to this Fred Allen show with his guest Jack Benny from June 26th of 1949. Gosh, it sure is hot out tonight, Portland. I think I'll stop in the drugstore and get a frozen frosted. A frozen frosted. Ought to go good now. Well, I'll see you later then. Good night. Good night, Portland. I'm sure, I'm sure going to miss Main Street, the jewelry store, the grocery, the pawn shop. Say, who is this man in front of the pawn shop with a moose head under his arm? Hello, friend. Henry Morgan. Henry, you in front of a pawn shop? Fred, when I'm working, I'm in front of the cigar store. Well, I know. When I'm not working, I'm in front of the pawn shop. <laughs> I gotta hock this moose head. Hock? But, Henry, you've been working all winter. I know I have, Fred, and I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and, Henry, I just read that you're going back on the air replacing Duffy's Tavern. Yeah, but that doesn't start until July 6th. But, Henry, what did you do with all... You worked all winter. Where, what did you do with all your money? Well, I got tired sitting around on the bare floor of the apartment, so I bought a rug and some furniture on the installment plan. I see. First week, I was out of work. To make the payments on the furniture, I had to borrow $300 from a loan company. Uh-huh. Now, I owe the loan company, so I have to pawn my moose head. Well, Henry, confidentially, that is a pretty mangy-looking moose head you have there. Fred, please, if it weren't for this moose head... I wouldn't be alive, out of work, and owing $300 today. <laughs> you mean the moose saved your life? Yes, Fred, it did. Last winter, I went hunting up in Canada. Yes? Got lost in the woods for 12 days. I had nothing to eat. Gosh. I was sitting by the edge of a lake, watching myself slowly starve to death, when this moose peeked out from behind a tree. You saw the moose, did I, you? I, uh, did. <laughs> I picked up my rifle. Yes. I was just about to pull the trigger when the moose looked at me with those big brown eyes. Yes. I didn't have the heart to shoot. I put down the rifle. The moose knew that even though you were starving, Henry Morgan, you had spared his life. Yes. And he was so grateful, that moose walked over to me and dropped dead. <laughs> You, uh, you ate the moose? I tried to eat him, Fred, but I couldn't look into those big brown eyes. No? So I went around where the moose couldn't see me. <laughs> and you ate your fill? Took me three days. And when you finished? Well, there was nothing left but the moose head. Fred, this moose head is my dearest friend. In fact, it's my only friend. Well, Henry, if this moose head means so much to you, why pawn it? Well, Fred, I gotta raise three hundred dollars. Three hundred dollars. If I don't pay the Mohawk Loan Company by four o'clock, I'll lose my furniture. Well, who owns this Mohawk Loan Company? I don't know who the chiseler is, Fred. Yeah. But he wants his three hundred dollars by four o'clock today. <laughs> this morning, 
Just this morning in the mail, I got a postcard showing a man sitting in the electric chair. <laughs> Underneath, it said, don't let this happen to you. <laughs> Pay your loan to Mohawk. Henry, you have got to get $300. But where? I think I know where, Henry. Follow me. <laughs> Well, Henry, here we are. This is the Chase National Bank. I'll see if this party is in. Say, guard. Yes, sir. We're looking for Mr. X. Is Mr. X expecting you? Yes, I'm a friend of Mr. X's. Go through that iron door and down the circular staircase. Thank you very much. Come on, Henry. Fred, oh, uh, who is Mr. X? Henry, his name is never mentioned. Yeah, but uh, do you think he'll lend me the $300? Shh, quiet. Here's another guard. You looking for someone, gentlemen? Uh, Mr. X. Is Mr. X expecting you? Yes, I'm a friend of Mr. X's. Go down through this trap door and crawl through the tunnel. Thank you. Come on, Henry. <laughs> Gee whiz, Fred, it's uh, dark. Say, uh, how much farther do we have to crawl? Shh, Henry, there's a flashlight. Uh, who goes there? It's all right, guard. <laughs> we have some business with Mr. X. Mr. X is in his personal vault. Straight ahead. Thank you. Come on, Henry. Help me open this door. <laughs> Gee whiz. Fred, look at the money in this vault. It's stacked up to the ceiling. Shh. I think Mr. X is coming. Hello, Fred. Mr. X, Fred, this is Jack Finney. <laughs> Well, Mr. X? Uh, you can call me Jack, Fred. I like to keep everything informal around the ball. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you, Jack. I, I hope we're not interrupting. No, it's all right, Fred. A little rest will do me good. I've been counting steadily since 5 o'clock this morning. <laughs> I've got a cramp in my tongue from wetting my fingers. <laughs> Jack, uh, meet a friend of mine. Uh, I'm Henry Morgan. Morgan? Are you one of J.P.'s nephews? <laughs> no, I am not related to uh, J.P. Morgan. You're not? No. Oh. <laughs> well, Fred, what's new? Uh, nothing much, Jack. How, uh, how long are you going to be in town? Oh, I'll be here counting all summer. Oh, you yeah. <laughs> This is Mr. Benny's vacation, Henry. He always spends the summer in his vault here. Gee, don't you miss the outdoors, Mr. Benny? No, no, it's cool down here, and it's so nice and green. <laughs> hey, you know something? I wouldn't mind spending a summer down here myself. Uh, Mr. Morton, is this the first time you've ever been in a vault? This is the first time I've ever been in a bank. <laughs> you, you don't believe in banks. Banks don't believe in me. <laughs> Jack, why don't you show Henry around your vault? I'll be glad to, but before we start, Mr. Morgan, I have to take a few precautions. Precautions? Yes. First, I'll have to examine the bottom of your shoes. For what? A chewing gum. <laughs> See, last summer, Rudy Valley came in here with chewing gum on his shoes, and when he left, $20, $10 bills were missing, and Rudy was four inches taller. <laughs> Henry, Henry, why don't you take off your shoe? All right, I think I will. Mr. Benny, uh, you mind if I go through in my bare feet? No, no, not at all. I'll carry your shoe just in case. Oh, you. thank you. Now, before we start, Mr. Morgan, are you a student of money? Well, Henry knows, Henry knows what money is. But I haven't been exposed to it lately. <laughs> well, I generally give this talk with a pointer. Well, do, do the best you can. All right, I'll use one of my fingers. A long thing. A long thing yeah. would be helpful. Now, here. Mr. Morgan, over here are my fives, here are my tens, here are my twenties, and this stack here is Confederate money. <laughs> Jack, what are you doing saving Confederate money? Well, if the South ever comes back, brother, I'll be the John D. Rockefeller of Atlanta. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Benny, uh, what is this in the glass case? Oh, that is the first dollar I ever made. Well, it looks like a string of beads. It's wampum. <laughs> the, first, 
The first dollar you ever made was wampum? Yes, yes. A nearsighted Indian passed through Waukegan when I was a boy. And I sold him my mother's shawl for a blanket. Oh, I see. <laughs> Jack, don't you ever think of anything else but money? If I ever do, I'll go right to a psychiatrist. <laughs> Tell me, when did you first think of money, Mr. Benny? The day I was born, I was a bottle baby. I know, but a lot of babies were bottle babies. Well, I was the first baby that ever got a nickel back on the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you've dedicated your entire life to the accumulation of money? Yes, yes, my boy, I have it. It's my fond hope that when I die, I'll go to Fort Knox. <laughs> Jack, the reason I brought Henry over... Uh, yeah, Mr. Benny, you see, by 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock. What time is it now? It's uh, quarter to 4. Hmm, the boy should be checking in. I wonder... Oh, that must be one of the boys now. Come in. Number one reporting, Mr. Benny. Okay, number one. You had a big day, 4,682 nickels. Good, good. So long, Mr. Benny. So long, number one. Say, hey, Jack, what are all those nickels? I run my own turnstile in the subway. <laughs> That's nickel. Since the city went to a dime, I'm cleaning up. Uh, Mr. Benny. Excuse me, Mr. Morgan. That's probably one of the other boys. Come in. There you are, Mr. Benny. Oh, thanks, Merce. We had a big day today. 7,600 nickels. Good. So yeah. long, Mr. Benny. So long, Merce. Jack, another turnstile? No, I also run my own slot at the automat. <laughs> How do you I have a compartment with a live herring in it? A live herring? When someone puts a nickel in the slot and the little window opens, yes. the herring feels the draft and slaps the window closed with a tail. Jack, you mean? I trained this herring and it was time well spent. Well, how long have you had the herring working for you in the automat? Only six months. He's already brought me in over $800. Hey. Say, uh, Mr. Benny, by 4 o'clock, if I don't have $300... Excuse me, Mr. Morgan. Come in. Here it is, Mr. Benny. Thanks, Bob. I got a whole chimney full today. Good, good. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Jack, what is that Santa? What is that Santa Claus doing in here? Why he works for me, Fred. A Santa Claus working in June? Yes, for people who do their Christmas shopping very early. Uh, Mr. Benny, uh, Mr. Benny, the reason that I'm here. Yes, see, Jack. Look, Henry has to borrow three hundred dollars by four o'clock, or some shyster with a loan company will take his furniture and his moose head. Yes, Mr. Benny. See, we thought that maybe you three hundred dollars. Hmm. I'm a good risk, Mr. Benny. I, I've been working all winter. Yes. You worked all winter and you're broke? I'm flatter than something that's been stepped on. Mr. Morgan, this is rather a personal question, but what do you do with your money? I spend it. <laughs> I, I see your problem already. <laughs> How do you spend your money? Well, after a hard day's work, I generally go into a bar for a cocktail. Yes. I buy drinks for everybody, and then we uh, go to dinner. We? After buying a few drinks, I suddenly acquire a crowd of friends. And you buy everybody dinner? Well, if I bring guests in to eat, I have to pick up the check, don't I? I've heard of it. <laughs> After dinner, the whole gang follows me to a nightclub. I, I pay the check and tip everybody wearing a mess jacket. Always end up broke. That's why I need $300. Mr. Morgan, if you would do as I do, you wouldn't need $300. Well, what do you do? Well, after a hard day's work like you, I go into a bar. And you, you buy a drink? First, I let out a shriek so everybody sees me, and then I faint. You faint? A crowd gathers. Somebody gives me three or four brandies to bring me two. <laughs> I get up off the floor, shake hands all around, and leave for dinner. Uh, do you eat alone, Mr. Benny? No, I usually find a group of friends at a table, and I sit with them. Who pays for the dinner? Well, all during the meal, I keep feeling my pad of butter. You keep feeling your butter? Yes. When it comes time to pay, I reach for the check. While my hand is flipping around, somebody else picks it up. <laughs> I'd like to know something. After dinner, do you go out to a nightclub? Always. I order champagne for everybody. And then just before the floor show finishes, I swallow four sleeping pills fast. Four sleeping pills? Yes. I don't know how the party ends up or who pays the check. I just wake up in bed the next day well rested. <laughs> you see, 
You see, Henry, Mr. Benny really knows how to live. Well, and nobody ever made me this cheap on my own program. <laughs> Mr. Chief, Mr. Benny, I'll certainly follow your advice. Oh, there's just one more thing. Yes, Mr. Morgan. Can you let me have $300? Yes, Jack. Henry has to have $300 by 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock? Why, it's 5 after 4 now. Excuse me, that's the phone. I'll answer it in the booth. Fred, it's 5 after 4. I'm ruined. Now, Henry, Henry, don't go to pieces. Well, Fred, my furniture, my moose head, the Mohawk Loan Company will take everything. Henry, I'll go home with you. Maybe I can talk to the shyster who's president of that Mohawk Loan Company. Oh, I'm sorry, fellas. I have to leave. That phone call was urgent. Some business just came up. Well, let's go, Henry. Maybe I can give you fellas a lift. Which way are you going? Well, I'm going home. I live on East 61st Street. Really? I'm going to East 61st Street. I live at 331. Now, that's a coincidence. I'm going to 331. Then you must be coming to my house. I don't know. I have to pick up some furniture and a moose head. Jack Getty, besides running a turnstile and a subway, a slot in the office. I order. also happen to be the shyster who's president of the Mohawk Loan Company. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. <laughs> WNBC and WNBC-FM, New York. The Fred Allen Show from June 26th of 1949, Fred Allen's last regular program on radio, last show of his own on the air. Jack Benny and Henry Morgan turning up as guests on that show. Fred Allen had a running uh, uh, problem with his programs. They were always so tight, uh, always had such uh, an abundance of material that he could... Uh, uh, never get everything in on, on time all the time, and I know how he feels. <laughs> but, uh, uh, of course, the old NBC chimes wait for no man, and so he was always uh, forever being uh, clipped off at the end of his show just because he uh, ran out of time. And, of course, the audience reaction was such that uh, uh, he wouldn't uh, have properly timed the, the response from an audience, the laughter, the applause, and so forth and so on. So um, for Fred's last uh, regular show on the air, uh, NBC clipped him off at the end of that. Well, we're not going to clip off Fred Allen or Jack Benny or any of the others this afternoon because we have a whole afternoon with the superstars, Jack Benny and Fred Allen, on our Those Were the Days program. This is Chuck Shaden on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. We have um, an excerpt from, uh, uh, three excerpts actually, from uh, Command Performance Broadcast, Armed Forces Radio Shows with Fred and Jack remembering some of the good old days, uh, then uh, trying to end their feud, and then also even going Christmas shopping. Then we have uh, Jack Benny and his cast doing their version of the Fred Allen Show and a stroll down Benny's Boulevard. Then from a big show program, we'll have uh, Fred Allen, Tallulah Bankhead, and a bunch of uh, interesting folks doing their version of the Jack Benny program, which they call the Pinch Penny Show. Then we have a, a, a complete Jack Benny program with um, uh, Fred Allen uh, as Jack's guest, and we're going to have an excerpt then from the most, uh, probably the best of the uh, Jack Benny, uh, Fred Allen radio get-togethers with Fred on his show in 1946, uh, trying to decide how to combat the quiz shows and coming up with an idea called King for a Day, and guess who turns up as a contestant on the show? Well, you know it's Jack Benny. You've probably heard that many times before. It's one of the classic confrontations uh, in the great feud of Jack Benny and Fred Allen. We'll have it all for you this afternoon on our Those Were the Days program. Next Saturday, the 17th of September, we will be saluting uh, some more superstars, the great ones, Al Jolson, Eddie Cantor, and Jimmy Durante. We will have uh, Walter Winchell narrating the life story of Jimmy Durante. We'll have Al Jolson starring in an hour-long Lux Radio Theater production from 1947 of The Jazz Singer. And we'll have the complete Eddie Cantor at Carnegie Hall concert from 1962. We'll also have lots of, uh, lots of big stars uh, uh, in and out of the afternoon as they drop in with uh, Jimmy Durante at his Club Durant. A good afternoon coming up next Saturday, too. In two weeks, on the 24th of September, we'll be tuning into radio from the 1950s. We'll have Have Gun, Will Travel, Silver Eagle Mountie, Fort Laramie, Dragnet, Frontier Gentleman, X-1, and Luke Slaughter of Tombstone, all radio shows from the 1950s. A lot of good things lined up. I hope you can uh, stay with us on these Saturday afternoons as we uh, swing into the fall season with some good broadcasting. 
You can keep track of the programs that we offer and lots of other things when you subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. And Jimmy Durante is on the cover of our newsletter for September, and that's just the first page of all the fun and entertainment you'll find in our September newsletter. A one-year subscription, 10 issues, is only $7. You can subscribe right now if you call us here at our broadcast studio at 545-2260. We'll begin your subscription with the September issue and include an invoice along with your first copy. Call us at 545-2260. Our newsletter is filled with articles from and about the good old days. This month, uh, we offer reprint stories about Eddie Cantor and Lena Horne, and there's an interesting behind-the-scenes look at radio in 1935 entitled The Unwritten Laws of Radio Row. Plus, we have some original articles. There's one about Patsy Montana, America's cowboy sweetheart. Mark Nelson writes about movie gimmicks in his film clips column. Mark will be with us tonight at the Memory Club. And Carl Pearson takes another look at the Glenn Miller Orchestra of the 1970s. And that's not all. You'll find the complete schedule of old-time shows that we offer on our Those Were the Days program, our listing of Saturday Night Memory Club movies, which resume tonight, our Dime Store Want Ad page, letters from listeners, and more. So why don't you subscribe now? A one-year subscription to our Nostalgia Newsletter is just $7. Call us at 545-2260. That's 545-2260. If you like, just send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But if it's easier, just give us a call now at 545-2260. <laughs> interest accumulator, champion of the people, defender of the vault, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of daily interest on passbook savings. And it shall be my duty as interest accumulator, not only to pay the highest interest permitted by the limit of the law, but to pay it to all persons holding passbook savings accounts perpetrated at Northwest Federal Savings, and to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all Chicagoland savers to open and hold an account at Northwest Federal Savings, earning top interest from the date of deposit to the date of withdrawal. Come on, Herringbone. We're going to Northwest Federal Savings to investigate the case of the growing balance. Northwest Federal Savings, serving you 63 hours a week in Chicago on Irving Park Road, in Edison Park on Northwest Highway, in Des Plaines on Dempster Street, in Norridge at Harlem and Irving, and in Arlington Heights on Algonquin at Golf. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. The superstars, Jack Benny and Fred Allen. Here's an excerpt now from uh, December 22nd of 1937. This is the Town Hall Tonight program. Uh, Fred Allen is the uh, star of the show. Jack Benny pops up with an interesting proposition for Fred Allen. Now, look, Portland, a thing on the program we don't need. Stuff I don't mind, but not a thing. <laughs> but, Mr. Allen, it isn't a thing. This is an old friend of yours from the days of Bodeville. If it's Otto the train seal, throw him a fish and tell him I'm busy. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Fred. If you'll just take your nose, that one you used to talk through, out of that microphone... <laughs> You'll see that it's me. Oh, Jack! Jack Benny! Well, I'm... Ter Wait a minute. There's a reception goes in there. Well, it doesn't have... I was... I was worried there for a minute. I was... <laughs> well, you've been on four times. If you want, took a little bit each time, it's better you get it all at once like this. Yeah. Let it pile up. Well, I'm terribly sorry, Jack. I didn't notice you. How long have you been standing there? Since 8 o'clock this morning. <laughs> They've been using me instead of the bull of a watch time. Say, Jack, did Mary come along with you? No, Porty. She wanted to come over, but she's busy with her Christmas shopping. Christmas shopping? Yeah, right now she's over at Bullock's Wilshire putting me through bankruptcy. <laughs> that gives me an idea. Howie, ho, Jack. So long, Porty. Well, Jack, this is quite a surprise, you dropping in. I didn't know you were going to be here tonight. I didn't know it either, Fred, until I heard you announce it five times last week. 
But don't get me wrong, Freddy. I appreciate that buildup. I'm one guy who knows that it pays to advertise. Now, listen here, Benny. If that's a hint, you're not getting one cent for crawling in here tonight, and you know it. <laughs> Why, Fred, I uh, really, I didn't expect to get paid for this. I haven't any more right to take money for working on this program than you have. <laughs> you for a while, eh? Now, uh... <laughs> Those armchair jokes, they'll hold you for a while. Eh? Now, hold on there. Hold on there, Benny. That's an insult. Well, if I, if I was Professor Quiz, I'd say correct. Absolutely correct. And if I was Major Bowes, you'd have left with a unit ten minutes ago. <laughs> hey, that's nice work if you can get it. You know, Freddie, I wouldn't mind being back in vaudeville again, though, would you? Ah, those were the good old days. Yes, sir. Say, Fred, no kidding. Will you ever forget the time... You and I were together at the Orpheum Theater in Sioux City, Iowa. Yeah. Only I was on the stage. <laughs> I don't care, Freddie. I made more money selling peanuts in one day than you did all week. <laughs> well, Jack, I didn't make much money in those days, but I was a pretty good juggler. Remember how I used to toss those Indian clubs in the air and do a funny monologue at the same time? I sure do. And, Fred, you remember when you dropped those clubs? Uh, you'd let him lay there right alongside of your joke. <laughs> yeah. Well, you ought to know you swept up the theater every night. <laughs> I did not. I used to stay in the theater late just to practice my violin. And you should have stuck to your broom. <laughs> I should have stuck to my own program, too. Uh, <laughs> I had to ask for this yet. Huh? Well, you had to write well, it yet. Uh, <laughs> well, Red, anyway, a lot of water has gone over the darn since then, huh? Over the darn? Yes, Fred, you know how careful we have to be. <laughs> but just think, Freddy, just think, here we are, both in Hollywood and both of us in pictures. It does seem unreasonable, doesn't it? <laughs> Of course, Fred, maybe I shouldn't point this out, but I, uh, I do make a lot more pictures than you do. Well, Jack, there's so little of you in each one, you have to make more. Oh, is that why they do it? I'm glad you brought that up. How do you like pictures, Fred? Fine, Jack. I just finished one called Sally, Irene, and Mary. I'm leaving for New York next week. Oh, they're releasing you instead of the picture. <laughs> now, Benny, if you're here to drip venom, heed your promiscuous spattering, and remember that retribution is the trailer that follows oral pollution. <laughs> Alan, you're just lucky. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> anyway, I had a hunch you were going back east, Fred, and that's why I came up here to see you. Have you decided uh, which way you're going back? I mean, uh... Which form of transportation? Well, I was going to take the boat and go through Panama. But I've got a hat, so oh. I decided to... Uh, <laughs> I decided to take the train. Well, Fred, I, of course, I don't want to influence you one way or the other, but uh, have you ever thought of driving back east? You know, by automobile? Uh, what kind of an automobile? Now, don't rush me. <laughs> And it's in good condition, too. <laughs> no kidding. Would you like to drive back home, Freddy? No, Jack. I'll, uh, I'll stick to the chief. Well, if you'd rather hang around with Indians. <laughs> the chief is a train, as you will find out when you finish your next picture, Mr. Benny. <laughs> Say, what are you trying to get at, anyway? Well, Fred, I own a Maxwell. And I thought that... You if... don't think you can palm that tin nightmare off on me, I hope. <laughs> Why I wouldn't be found dead in that car. Say, you're no better than the engine. <laughs> Why, the engine in that steam cabinet is so dead, the front wheels are nothing but rubber pallbearers. 
Where is that uncovered wagon? It's right outside the door. Hey, boys, boys. Yes, yes sir, Manny. Uh, will you drive my Maxwell in, please? Oh, sure. Now, be careful, fellas. It's a high-powered car there, you know. Right in here, boys. Right in here. Well, uh, you want us to leave it right here, Mr. Benny? Yes, yes, thanks, fellas. Hey, what's, what's that noise? Noise? I'll cut off the motor so we can hear it. <laughs> That's better. Yes. Hey, uh, Mr. Benny, I guess this belongs to you. Oh, the door. Yes, thanks. <laughs> to close it and it came off in my hand. <laughs> well, you can stick it back on with a little new skin, Jack. Say, watch that bottle of scotch doing tight on the front. That's for the radiator on New Year's Eve. <laughs> it looks like the car's got a hangover already. Benny, you may not be a snake in the grass, but you're sure hanging around with the rattler there. <laughs> That's libel, Alan. And if I had my writers here, what we'd call you be a poor bell rad. Say, what stuff? Say, who started it? Say, what was that? Did the engine drop out? No, Smarty, it's the new sunken motor. And listen to this horn. That note is by Stokowski. Well, how? How is, how is the car on gas? Well, I get about four miles to the court. <laughs> if I insist, of If you, uh, <laughs> if you put your foot down. Yes, yes. Well, uh, how much does that make to the gallon? Well, I never put in a gallon. I don't believe in spoiling a car. <laughs> you know how it is with gas tanks. Easy come, easy go. Well, Alan, what do you say? Well, now that I've had a good look at this bear trap, Jack, I know why the Maxwell people went into the coffee business. <laughs> now, Freddie, I'm not begging you to take this car, only I thought, well, you walk all the time, you're not getting any younger. I think you ought to take your varicose veins out for a spin once in a while. <laughs> what are you asking for this Rhapsody and junk? <laughs> I'm asking $95 FOB. FOB for old Benny. <laughs> How about it, Fred? Hey, if you don't know, <laughs> laughing at your next Sunday show already. I can't wait. If you don't know, <laughs> I'd give a thousand dollars if I could think of an answer right now. <laughs> If you don't know by now that I don't want that car, you ought to have your skull thinned. All right, Fred, as long as you don't want to buy it, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll wrap it in cellophane, tie a big red ribbon around it, and give it to you for Christmas. How's that? If I wake up Christmas morning and find that monstrosity in my stocking, I'll go barefooted the rest of my life. <laughs> that would be nothing new for you, you hillbilly. <laughs> So you don't even want it for a present, huh? I don't want it present, past, the future. You can take that animated skillet. All right, Fred, all right. I merely wanted to be a good fellow, that's all. If you don't want the car, and I think you don't, I'll be on my way. No hard feelings, I hope. No, Jack, I haven't anything against you, not Benny the man. I'm just not in the market, that's all. I hope I didn't offend you. Oh, no, Freddy, I'll just have to sell it to some other uh, guy. <laughs> Merry Christmas, old boy. Same to you, Jack, and good luck. Thanks, Freddy. Goodbye. <laughs> hey, what was that, Jack? That's what my car thinks of you, Alan. <laughs> Great fun with uh, Fred Allen and uh, Jack Benny on uh, Fred's Town Hall Tonight program, a little excerpt from December 22nd of uh, 1937. Good comedy there. Chuck Shaden here with you in an afternoon. That's a beautiful Saturday afternoon on our Those Were the Days program, WNIB Chicago at FM 97. Beautiful weather outside. Great sounds inside your radio, whether you're inside or outside, listening into all this good comedy from Mr. Benny and Mr. Allen. We'll have the uh, 
the great vaudeville, vaudeville team of Benny and Alan, or was it Alan and Benny coming up in just a little bit? Boys and girls, may we suggest that you step into the Paul Meyer Shoe Store in Evanston and then step out with a pair of Stepmaster shoes. Stepmaster shoes are reasonably priced, yet are made of quality ingredients by skilled shoemakers right here in Illinois. Not only do they come in basic infant's white high shoes and saddle oxfords, but in shiny patent Mary Janes for little girls and high fashion styles for bigger boys and girls. Your headquarters for Stepmaster Shoes is the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, 2924 Central Street in Evanston. Why don't you step in and have a fit? Now, uh, we would like to uh, step into our hall closet for a moment and let you hear a little bit of the beginning of one of the sounds on our cassette tape of the month for the month of September. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is Raymond, your host at the squeaking door. Come in, won't you? Well, you're shivering. Cold? Oh. Well, don't let it throw you. Just remember that many are cold, but few are frozen. <laughs> well, our story to be different tonight is about murder. Murder and a clock. So, if you've got a little time to kill, let's do it now, huh? And that's just the beginning uh, of uh, our inner sanctum mystery. The Judas Clock is the name of the story, and uh, you're going to find that that is a good show. Actually, we have two good shows on our cassette for September because we also offer a fine suspense drama starring Orson Welles in The Hitchhiker. In all, it's a full hour of thrills and chills from radio's classic mystery dramas, our cassette for September, Inner Sanctum, and Suspense. Only $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Orson Welles himself introduces and stars in a classic suspense drama from 1942 called The Hitchhiker, plus Barry Kroger stars in The Judas Clock, a chilling suspense story from 1945. 60 minutes of great radio entertainment, all yours on a single cassette tape from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Or you can get your tape at any of the five offices of Northwest Federal Savings, or when you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road. Get these two new shows for your good old collection, Suspense plus Inner Sanctum, our cassette tape of the month for September. $5 from the Hall Closet. Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Moving right along now, as they say, with our Jack Benny, Fred Allen superstar show today, we go back to an excerpt from a Jack Benny program from August 3rd of 1950. Jack's guest is uh, Fred Allen, and you'll hear Rochester in this. And, of course, they talk about um, the great uh, vaudeville team of uh, uh, Benny and Allen. Come in. Hello, Jack. Hello, Rochester. Well, Fred! Fred Allen! Well, Fred, this is a surprise. Really? When did you get in town? Last night. Last night? Well, why, uh, why didn't you call me at my hotel? You mean you're staying at one that has phones? <laughs> Well, no, but there's a candy store in the lobby that takes messages. <laughs> oh, I see. Say, boss, as long as Mr. Allen's in town, why don't you put him on your stage show? Well, thank you, Rochester, but I couldn't very well go out on a stage now. I haven't got any material. Well, don't you have any of your old vaudeville routines left? Well, if I did, I'd be on television. <laughs> It would be great if you could join me on my stage show, Fred. Well, I'd uh, really love to, Jack, but I have to rush back to Hollywood. I've been offered the lead in a new picture. A new picture? Uh -huh. No dimension. It's a new thing that's coming out. <laughs> well, 
When it comes out, you don't dimension the whole thing. <laughs> so far, that's better than what we've got written here. <laughs> but, uh, in this picture, Jack, yes. I play the part of a test pilot in Los Angeles. I see. The picture is called Breaking the Smog Barrier. <laughs> It's a shame you can't stay over, Fred, so we could appear together. It'd be like old times. Say, Mr. Barry, did you and Mr. Allen once do an act together in Vaudeville? We sure did, Rochester. We had a lot of fun in those days. Oh, gosh. You remember, Jack, how we'd always celebrate with a big dinner at Lindy's every time we got a job? Yeah, we'd always get the best. Shrimp cocktail, turtle soup, chef salad. Filet mignon, stuffed potatoes, strawberry shortcake. Then I'd top it all off with a big glass of Ovaltine. Ovaltine? Well, he wanted to be asleep when the check came. <laughs> Those were the good old days. I'll never forget the time we rehearsed and polished our act for weeks. And we went to see Mickey Rockford, the biggest booking agent in New York. <laughs> Come on, Fred. I think Mr. Rockford's office is down the hall. Hey, it's crowded in here, Jack. Yeah, I guess we'll have to talk to the secretary. Miss, uh, we'd like to see Mr. Rockford. Do you have an appointment? Appointment? Yes. We're uh, Benny and Allen. Benny and Allen? Yes. Don't you recognize us? Why? Is there a reward? <laughs> You don't, uh, you don't understand, girlie. We do a vaudeville act. Really? Which one throws the fish? <laughs> Say, that is clever. <laughs> Miss, you ought to be in show business yourself. Me in show business? Yes. I know a magician who saws a woman in half. You'd look better in two pieces. <laughs> Take it easy, Fred. Look, look, miss, we don't, we don't want to argue. We'd just like to see our agent, Mr. Rockford. Well, first I'll need some information. Now, uh, what's the name of your act again? Alan and Benny. <laughs> I thought you said it was Benny and Alan. Well, at 2 o'clock, our billing changes. <laughs> well, what kind of an act do you do? Violin, clarinet, and snappy patter. Uh -huh. And where have you played? Oh, all over. Well, where? Well, just, just tell her the important dates, Jack. Yeah, go ahead. Well, we did a week in Sow Belly, Wyoming. <laughs> A week in Loose Tooth, Arizona. <laughs> Three days in Stagnant Water, New Mexico. <laughs> and we also played The Palace here in New York. Sow Belly, Loose Tooth, Stagnant Water, and The Palace. Well, at least you worked your way up. No, we played The Palace first. <laughs> Mr. Rockford's busy right now, so just have a seat and I'll call you. All right. Oh, um, by the way, Mr. Allen, I don't mean to be personal, but are you an American citizen? <laughs> yes, I got these slant eyes from pulling off a tight derby. <laughs> Come on, Fred, let's sit down. Okay. Yes? Yes. Oh, very well, Mr. Rockford. Oh, boys, Mr. Rockford will see you now. Good, good. Come on, Fred, let's go in, okay? Oh, come on in, fellas. Come on in. Close the door. Sit down. Thank you. Mr. Rockford, I'm Jack Benny. This is Fred Allen. That's right, Mr. Rockford. Remember, you booked our act in the palace seven years ago. Oh, yes. What business are you in now? <laughs> Well, we're still in show business. Yes, and we thought you could book us. 
Please, fellas. Our new act is sensational. At least give us a chance, Mr. Rockford. Yes, all we need is one good break, you know. I gave you a break when I put you in Lowe's Flatbush. <laughs> Some break. They opened it with Fink's Mules, then Major Doty's Dogs came out, then Manny's Monkeys, then Powers Dancing Elephants. So what? Well, by the time we came out, we looked like the last two passengers on Noah's Ark. <laughs> Well, look, boys, I'm very busy. And Please, I... Mr. Rockford, just listen to our opening number. It'll only take a second. All right, but before you... Oh, excuse me. Hey, come in. Mr. Rockford, here's the 10% commission I owe you for booking my act last week. Oh, thank you. Oh, wait a minute. The cute boy. Sonny, what's your name? Eddie Cantor. <laughs> Eddie Cantor? Potatoes are cheaper, tomatoes are cheaper. Now's the time to fall in love. Mr. Rockford, how about listening to our, our new act? Oh, all right, if you insist. Uh, ready with your clarinet, Fred? Ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One, two. Mr. Allen. <laughs> what is it, Mr. Benny? Have you heard that they're making women's bathing suits out of spun glass? Women's bathing suits out of glass? Well, that's worth looking into. <laughs> I'll take it, Mr. Allen, if you will. Music once saved my uncle's life. Well, how did music save your uncle's life? They played the Star Spangled Banner just as he was sitting in the electric chair. <laughs> Take it, Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen. I want you to meet my new girl. Her name is Well Enough. Why do you call your girl Well Enough? Because I want the boys to leave Well Enough alone. <laughs> How about the finale, Mr. In unison? All right. <laughs> out of the draw. <laughs> Maybe he's looking for a contract. Fellas. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, 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 Mr. Rockford. To tell you the truth, fellas, I'm confused. The, the whole act leaves me cold. It, it's neither fish nor fowl. Well, that's funny. The last agent we went to thought it was both. <laughs> well, Mr. Rockford, you mean you can't book us anywhere? Well, oh, actually, I don't have a thing open for a double. Uh, have either of you considered doing a single? What? And break up the act? Why, we've been together for years. You can't split Benny and Alan. It's ridiculous. We're more than just a team. We're partners, friends, buddies. Why, we'd rather starve than let anything come between us. Well, that's a shame because I've got an opening for a single in Scranton for $15 a week. I'll take it. <laughs> 
if that's the way you feel, I'll I'll take it for fourteen dollars a week, Mr. Roberts. Fred, Fred, you steal a job away from your partner, your buddy, your friend? Some friend. What did you ever do for me? Why, you puff-eyed ingrate? For years, you, we've lived off my violin, my brains, my talent, my joke. And my money. <laughs> and you, listen, you miser, as for your violin playing, I have heard cleaner notes from a toothless Russian sipping borscht. <laughs> Just lucky you've had me and my clarinet. Clarinet? The only way you could make a living with that clarinet is if you put a nail on the end of it and went out in the park. <laughs> Mr. Rockford, rather than let you hire this no-talented wage cutter, I'll take the job for $10 a week. Oh, yeah? Well, I'll take it for eight. I'll take it for five. Well, I'll take it for three. Well, I'll take it for nothing. So will I. Well, at that price, I can afford both of you. <laughs> Jackson, did you hear that? We're working. Fred! Yes! Jack Benny and Fred Allen. The good old days of vaudeville there. That was exactly the way it started for those two guys, if you want to believe that. <laughs> uh, from uh, the Jack Benny show from uh, August 3rd of 1950 with Rochester. And Mel Blanc was in there. Some great talents uh, Two great talents, of course, uh, Jack Benny and Fred Allen, the real superstars. They were superstars before that word came in the good usage, you know? Everybody wants to be a superstar today, or they say Elvis was a superstar, and he was. But um, uh, Jack Benny and Fred Allen were superstars when they weren't called superstars. Uh, they just were superstars. You knew it, right? This is Chuck Shaden with the Superstars this afternoon on our Those Were the Days program from WNIB Chicago at FM 97. You know, we're here every Saturday afternoon from 1 to 5 with all the good old radio shows, some memories for those of you who have memories, and some, uh, some imagination-building things for those of you who don't have the memory of these shows. An awful lot of folks who have never had a chance to hear these shows the first time around. We're pleased to be able to um, uh, be the guy to spin them your way for the second time around. Have you ever had someone try um, to get you to buy something? Oh, sure. Lots of folks try to get you to buy something. We do it on Saturday afternoons. Uh, anytime you turn on the radio or the TV, walk into a store, someone's trying to get you to buy something. But I know somebody who wants you to sell something. That's Frank Lamphere of Antique Realty in Chicago. He's looking for sellers. And uh, if you've been thinking about putting your home on the market, uh, he says that there's never been a better time to do so. It's a seller's market now. And and Antique Realty at 5852 West Diversity Avenue would like to uh, chat with you about your home. Now, Frank Lamfer is more than a licensed real estate broker. He's a certified appraiser, and he can give you a realistic estimate of the current market value of your home at no cost or obligation. He'll discuss sales of comparable homes in your community and offer some thoughtful advice about selling your property. Antique Realty is a member of the Northwest Multiple Listing Service, so when you list your home with Antique Realty, you'll find another 130 member real estate firms joining in the search for the right buyer at the right price. That's like walking into Antique Realty and having 130 people there waiting to help you. Call or visit Antique Realty, 5852 West Diversity, just east of Austin. It's the real estate office with a red and white striped canopy out front and lots of antique furnishings inside. Antique Realty. 889-3840. You'll find them in the yellow pages under Real Estate Antique. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where plenty of free parking makes it a pleasure to shop your favorite store or service. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Wabat. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center. Easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Quality plus value seven days a week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center in Wilmette. Now some more from uh, Fred Allen and Jack Benny. This is uh, from a command performance, Armed Forces Radio Broadcast, where all the big stars got together. This is a program from uh, Christmas Day of 1943. Every year during the war years, 1942, 3, 4, and then even afterward, 45, Command Performance produced a gala all-star Christmas program for broadcast to the guys in the, the service all over the world. This is a uh, almost a 10-minute excerpt 
from uh, a command performance from Christmas Day of 1943. You'll hear Bob Hope on this, and of course, uh, Fred Allen and Jack Benny. And now, fellas, I'd like to present a couple of men you all know, and it took a lot of us, uh, it took a lot of us to bring these two men together tonight, and it'll probably take a lot more to pull them apart, Jack Benny and Fred Allen. <laughs> Stop bowing, Benny. Every time that gray head goes by, it reminds me of Barbara Fricci. <laughs> you You're jealous, Fred, because I can bend without creaking. <laughs> well, Jack and Fred, it's good to see you back together for Christmas and not fighting. After all, two middle-aged men should watch their blood pressure. <laughs> Look who's talking, middle-aged men. Listen, Hope, your middle is aged more than ours. You know? <laughs> That's just a figure of speech, really. Well, with a figure like yours, I wouldn't go around making speeches. <laughs> Besides, Bob, you've got us all wrong. There was never any ill feeling between Jack and me. What are you talking about, Fred? I heard you say on the air one night that Benny squeezed the dollar bill so hard that Washington got buck teeth. <laughs> he did not, Bob. All he said was, I wouldn't pay a nickel to applaud a bubble dance with a hat pin. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> Sounds as though Hope's writer wrote that for you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can't... No, you fellas have got the whole thing wrong. I merely said that Jack took the first buck he ever made, slapped it on his head, and had skin grafted over it. <laughs> Every time he walks down Hollywood Boulevard on Dollar Day, his scalp twitches. <laughs> Bob, that was just a casual remark made in passing. There was no malice intended. Of course not. Hey, that's a straight line. What am I doing with that? <laughs> I'd settle for a line, but just a second, Jack. How about the time you said Fred's eyes look like fly specks peeking over two ping pong balls? <laughs> Bob, now wait, I've got the face and you guys are doing all the mugging. I mean, I've... Jack never said that at all. All Jack said was that I looked as though Santa Claus had come down my nose and left a bag under each eye. I did not, Fred. Remember, I said you were the only civilian I know with a sad sack under each eye. <laughs> That's right, Jack, and I think that's one of the biggest laughs you have ever gotten on the air. Well, thank you, Freddy. That's the spirit. That's more like it, boys. What's more like it, son? <laughs> yes, we can straighten this out ourselves, Mr. Skelton. Oh. <laughs> Please, that's the Sinatra of my life. Please. <laughs> have a line coming up, Mr. Hope. That's you, though. All right, I'll give you the other line. Who asked you to squeeze toothpaste on these troubled waters? Well, I was only trying to be nice, but that's out of character for me. I'm going to get out of here. You two guys lean on each other. So long. Nice exit. <laughs> <laughs> He, uh, he got a big hand there, didn't he? Yes, Jack. Uh, people were sure glad to see him go. <laughs> you know, J Jack, is this the same program that Jimmy Durante was on? Is this the same program still? I think still? so. I think so. <laughs> it's supposed to be a Christmas program. I didn't think we'd get on until New Year's. You know? <laughs> well, Fred, here we are, though. And am I happy to see you. Yes, Jack, here we are, and am I happy to see you. Gee, Fred, you're, you're looking fine. Yeah, thanks, Jack. You're looking fine, too. Well, this can't last long, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, Fred, welcome to California. Uh, what are you out here for? The orange picking season? <laughs> well, I have been doing a little picking while I'm waiting to hear from Monogram. <laughs> But 
I, I really came out here to make a picture, Jack. A picture? Good. You know, things have changed since you made your last picture, Fred. They talk now. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I, uh, I talk a blue streak. I'm ready for Technicolor, if they talk. <laughs> well, I see you brought your... Now, wait a minute. That's my laugh. I know, I know. <laughs> I see you brought your famous wit over the Rockies with you. <laughs> By the way, where are you living, Fred? Well, I've only been here six weeks, Jack. I haven't gotten a room yet. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it gets pretty chilly here at night, Fred. Doesn't the cold bother you? No, I, I picked up an old Indian blanket at Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. It's a little crowded in there with the old Indian, but that's... <laughs> that's housing in California yeah. today, Jack. You know, when you're away from home nowadays, Fred, things are pretty tough. Travel is difficult, too. Now, take my case. I've just returned from a 32,000-mile trip overseas where I entertained thousands of men. I, uh, I, was, uh, I was waiting for that. I was wondering how you were going to work that in. I was just... <laughs> it was a thrilling trip, Fred. South America, Africa, Sicily, the boot of Italy. The heel finally reached the boot. <laughs> Fred, you're jealous, that's all. I want. When I was in Egypt... I did a special show for King Tut. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. King Tut has been dead for 3,000 years. I know. He was a very tough audience there. <laughs> and he still looks better than you do. <laughs> well, I wouldn't talk. Every time I look at your scalp, I think of that song, The Surrey with the Fringe on Top. <laughs> I don't get the connection, Fred. I drive an automobile. Well, all right. Sorry with the fringe on top, Maxwell with the jerk inside. What's the difference? <laughs> Lucky for you, Alan, that I don't understand that type of humor. You, uh, you don't understand my humor? Why, I remember you in vaudeville, Benny. The only reason you carried a fiddle was to beat off the audience. <laughs> Well, Fred, you never had to beat off an audience. For your first ten years in the theater, you did your act in the men's powder room. <laughs> and that reminds me, Benny, you still owe me 40 cents for towels, by the way. <laughs> ah, those were the happy days, though. Fred, remember the time we played South Bend? Krauss and his mathematical cat were on the bill with us. Krauss with, us? with his mathematical yeah. cat. Remember the opening show? The cat had kittens on the stage and we couldn't top it. Yeah. <laughs> Funny, too. You shouldn't have had any trouble with that puss of yours. <laughs> See, I thought that would have been a yell. I there. did, too. I puss seldom <laughs> Cat. Puss. Well, Puss has seen its best day. I, I guess. guess. <laughs> Say, Fred, will you ever forget Mrs. Swallow's boarding house in Baltimore? Oh, in Baltimore. I had a room, Jack, that was so small, the ceiling was so low, the mice had to run around on their hands and knees. In the... <laughs> well, Fred, in your room, they had to pray for something to eat. <laughs> well, of course, in your room, they were sure of a crumb. They had a little... <laughs> Things were tough in those days, Jack, but we didn't mind, did we? No, and I want to say right now, Fred, you were a real trooper. Uh, that goes for you, too, Jack. You're the salt of the earth. Thanks, Fred. But really, you shouldn't admit it. I mean, even if it's Christmas, we, we shouldn't be so friendly. Why not, Jack? Don't throw bouquets at me. <laughs> Don't please my folks too much. Don't laugh at my jokes too much. People will say we're in love. Don't sigh and gaze at me. Are you swooning? Your sighs are so like mine. Your eyes mustn't glow like mine. People will say we're in love. Don't start collecting things. Give me my rose and my glove. Sweetheart, they're suspecting things. People will say we're in love, so in love. People will.
Jack Benny and Fred Allen from a command performance broadcast of December 25th, Christmas Day of 1943, singing together there. You can just tell that those two guys are having a good time while they're doing that, can't you? Almost as much fun as we're having listening into those good old... Uh, those good old radio meetings of Jack Benning and Fred Allen. This is Chuck Shaden on our Those Were the Days program, WNIB, Chicago, FM 97. All afternoon today, the sounds of Jack Benning and Fred Allen, two superstars of the golden age of radio. We have lots more of it coming up, so you want to make sure you stick around for it. The fine family of Paterno offers you a selection of fine wines from the vineyards of the world, from California to France, from Italy to Portugal. You'll find the Paterno Wine Cellar stocked with the widest selection of wines from all the best places. Paterno Foremost Liquors at 5303 Milwaukee Avenue at Central, just north of Foster. It's the largest beverage store of its kind in all Chicagoland. A visit to the Paterno Wine Cellar is an experience you won't forget, and you'll return often to keep your own wine cellar stocked, whether it's an intimate candlelit dinner for two or an important dinner party for quite a few. You'll find everything you need to add the word special to your next occasion. Visit the wine cellar at Paternal Foremost Liquors, open Monday through Saturday from 9 in the morning till 10 at night, Sunday from noon to 6. Paternal Foremost Liquors at 5303 Milwaukee Avenue at Central, just north of Foster. Do you remember... What evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> I'll soon Up in the sky! Look! It's a giant bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! The Golden Days of Radio, brought back once more by Mark 56 Records. What wonderful memories! Relive them again with The Shadow, The Lone Ranger, The Green Hornet, Burns and Allen. You can buy these and over 100 other original radio broadcasts on Mark 56 LP Records, a gift for remembering. Major Bowes, Tarzan, The Whistler. Hundreds of old-time radio shows on records, cassettes, and 8-track tape are available at our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. We're open Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Saturday till 7.30, and Sunday from noon to 5. Metro Golden Memories, the MGM shop. If you're planning on coming to our memory club tonight, you could pos possibly pop over to the MGM shop on your way there because we'll be open till 7.30. By the way, I want to remind you that the new book on Riverview, Gone But Not Forgotten by Chuck Voldarsic, the story of the world's largest amusement park. That book is now available at our Metro Golden Memory Shop. You can come in and pick it up at any time. It's $9.95, and it's a bargain at twice the price. But uh, you'll want to make sure you pop in to get it. If you pop into the MGM shop tomorrow afternoon, you can meet the author. Chuck Voldarsic will be there to autograph copies of his book. We'll be along there, too. Say hello to you if you want to stop in. And uh, Chuck says he's going to come to the uh, Memory Club this evening, too, with a stack of uh, Riverview books. So if you uh, would like to pop into the Memory Club tonight to see the um, Jack Benny, Fred Allen movie, you can also see uh, Chuck Voldarsic and get your copy of the Riverview book. Uh, he'll have copies there, and I'm sure he'll be more than happy to autograph a copy for you. So you have a couple of chances this weekend to get an autographed copy of the um, Riverview Gone But Not Forgotten uh, picture book. A lot of text, too, in there, giving you a good, a good, um, a good story of what happened uh, during those golden days of Riverview. It's nine ninety five, available at our Metro Golden Memory Shop. This is Chuck Shaden on our Those Were the Days program from WNIB Chicago at FM 97. We're going back now to another Christmas uh, with Fred Allen and Jack Benny. The command performance uh, excerpt we heard a moment ago was from Christmas Day of 1943. We turn back the clock yet another year to Christmas Day of 1942, and uh, we have Bob Hope again and uh, Fred Allen and Jack Benny with uh, some thoughts about the famous feud. Well, man, for a long time, Jack Benny has been a feuding with Fred Allen. But thousands of you guys in the AEF have commanded that on this Christmas Eve, the feud should be patched up. And right this minute, the Martins and the Coys of Radio are holding a special peace conference in New York. So hello, New York. Command performance ready for Fred Allen and Jack Benny. 
And now, ladies and gentlemen, from New York City, we bring you two lads who, after a seven-year misunderstanding, have reunited in the spirit of the Christmas season. So here they are, folks, those two entertaining boys, the old vaudeville team of Jack Benny and Fred Allen. Thank you, thank you. Uh, pardon me, uh, Mr. Announcer, but I think you have that billing a little uh, wrong. The proper way to announce this act is Fred Allen and Jack Benny. You see, my name comes first. Uh, what do you mean, your name first? Well, if you will remember, Mr. B, I, uh, I paid the room rent today. <laughs> we are not sleeping on the fire escape tonight. Oh, that's right. Introduce us again, Mr. Wells. If you okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so here they are, folks, those two entertaining boys the old Bonneville team of Fred Allen and Jack Benny. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, hey, wait a minute. I just happened to think of something. Uh, Mr. Announcer, my name should come first. Your name? Yeah, you see, I'm the guy that got our tuxedos out of Hawk. Remember? Uh, oh, that's right. That's if it right. wasn't for me, you'd be here in your underwear tonight. <laughs> You uh, wouldn't even be here, Mr. Benny. <laughs> wait, wait just a minute. I can straighten this whole thing out very easily. Here they are, folks. Those two hams, blue eyes and nasal hazel. <laughs> Say, Jack, people are... This is great, isn't it? Three receptions and we haven't done anything <laughs> yet. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, people are certainly... I, I wanted to get a little joking, if you don't mind. No, no, no. People... <laughs> People are certainly saving their tires these days. You know, I was riding down 42nd Street there this afternoon on a streetcar, and Henry Ford got on. <laughs> Fred. Fred, uh, Fred, wait a minute. Bob Hope just did that joke in Hollywood. Well, I know, Jack, but there's three hours difference in time. That joke didn't even get here yet. <laughs> I, I thought I thought you were just giving it another chance, you know. <laughs> you know, Freddie. Um, you know, Freddie. I'm. Uh, I'm <laughs> Freddie, I'm sorry well, that I. Laugh, I, I don't I, laugh if you're sorry. <laughs> Play the part. If you're acting, if you're sorry. Talk Look, Freddie. You. I'm really. I'm terribly sorry that I argued with you over our billing. Well, I'm sorry too, Jackie. After all, this is Christmas Eve. Yes, sir. And Freddie, you know what the greatest thing in the world is today? It isn't money, is it? No, it isn't. And it isn't butter, Jackie. <laughs> And it isn't sugar. No, it isn't sugar, Jack. I tell you, Fred, the greatest thing in the world today is friendship. You're right, Jack. Friendship. <laughs> if you're ever in a jam, here I am. If you're ever... You land in jail, I'm your bail. It's friendship, friendship. Just a perfect friendship. When other friendships have been forgot, ours will still be hot. La 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 dig dig dig. Oh, Freddy. Yes, Jack. I understand there's a shortage of fat. Why don't you turn in your head? <laughs> if you're ever up a tree, fall to me, I'm on key. <laughs> if you're ever down a well, ring my bell. If you're ever lose your teeth and you're out to dine, borrow mine. It's friendship, friendship. Just a perfect friendship. When other friendships have been for gate, ours will still be great. La 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 chop chop chop. Oh, Jack. Yes, Freddy. I understand there's a shortage of heads. So why don't you turn in one of yours? <laughs> If they ever black your eyes, <laughs> be wise. 
Fred Allen and Jack Benny. They're on a command performance program, actually from uh, Christmas Eve, December 24th of 1942. Uh, December 24th, December 25th, they were, they were pre-recorded to be broadcast on those days all over the world during the war years. Uh, all of the shows were uh, never generally recorded for broadcast, but they had been recorded, and that's why we have them to share with you on a Saturday afternoon. This is WNIB Chicago at FM 97. My name is Chuck Shaden. We're here every Saturday from 1 to 5 with all the good old radio shows for you. This Saturday, saluting superstars Jack Benny and Fred Ellen. We have lots more material with Jack and Fred for you. As a matter of fact, Jack and Fred will be on the screen in the Memory Club tonight. We resume our movies this evening after a summer break. And in the community room at Northwest Federal Savings, tonight you'll see Love Thy Neighbor from 1940, starring Jack Benny and Fred Ellen as they carry their famous radio feud onto the silver screen. Rochester is there, Eddie Anderson, the Mary Max, and Mary Martin, too. She sings My Heart Belongs to Daddy. It's a good show, and I think you'll enjoy it, so why don't you plan on coming over tonight? The community room at Northwest Federal Saving is at 4901 West Irving Park Road in Chicago. That's about a block west of Cicero Avenue on Irving Park. There's plenty of free parking in the large lot at the rear of our office on Dakin Street or you can take CTA transportation to the door. Memory Club movies begin at 8 o'clock. The doors open at 7.30. Dues are a dollar and a quarter a meeting. This is not a real club as such. We don't uh, discuss the movies. Uh, we don't dissect them. We just enjoy them. Give you a little bit of program notes about the film itself, and, um, and then we sit back and relax. We always have a Lucky Strike Extra, uh, an unannounced short subject, and we'll have one of those tonight for you, too as we get back in the swing with the Memory Club. So I hope you can join us. Why don't you plan now to pop over to Northwest Federal on Irving Park Road and have a good time with the, uh, the 1940 film starring Jack Benny and Fred Allen. See these guys we've been hearing all afternoon. See them on the screen in Love Thy Neighbor. By the way, all of our Memory Club movies are listed in advance in our nostalgia newsletter and radio guide. And that's just part of the information and entertainment you'll get. Uh, when you subscribe. A year subscription, 10 issues, is only $7. If you would like to subscribe, you can do so right now when you call us at 545-2260. We'll begin your subscription with the current September issue. Get it out to you at the beginning of the week. We'll include an invoice along with your first copy. 545-2260. Our newsletter is filled with articles from and about the good old days. We have reprint stories from the past and original articles about the past. We have our Dime Store Want Ad page, letters from listeners, and our complete Those Were the Days Old Time Radio schedule. It tells you the guide to what we're doing. If you had the uh, September newsletter in front of you, you would know the different things that we're planning for you as we go along. And it tells the time of each of these segments, too, if you are taping the shows. Why don't you subscribe now? A one-year subscription to our Nostalgia Newsletter is just $7. Call us at 545 2260 If you want, just send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter Box 421, Morton Grove 60053. But if it's easier, just give us a call now at 545-2260. The Green Bumblebee. <laughs> He hunts the biggest of all game. 
Come on, Cato. Let's step through the secret panel in the rear of the closet in our bedroom. Yes, but Mr. Bled, not... Now, Cato, let's move quickly through this narrow passageway built within the walls of our apartment building. But Mr. Bled must say... Never mind, Cato. This passage leads to an adjoining, supposedly abandoned building where we have our sleek, super-powered automobile. But Mr. Bled should know not that... now, Cato. We must drive quickly to Northwest Federal Savings to take advantage of a wide variety of savings programs. But Mr. Bled... Hurry, Cato. Press that special button and a section of the wall will lift automatically. But, Mr. Blit, the button... Never mind, Cato. We've got to hurry to Northwest Federal. I'll press that button myself. Mr. Blit, the button not work. Not work? Don't be silly, Cato. It always works for the green bumblebee. Cato, we're off to Northwest Federal. But, Mr. Blit, the wall... At 4901 Irving Park Road. Mr. Blit, the wall... One block west of Cicero. Mr. Blit, the wall... Miss Ablett? I know, Cato, I know. Just hand me a Northwest Federal save by mail envelope, will you? What you think I am? Faithful ballot? Northwest Federal Savings, serving you 63 hours a week in Chicago on Irving Park Road, in Edison Park on Northwest Highway, in Des Plaines on Dempster Street, in Norridge at Harlem and Irving, and in Arlington Heights on Algonquin at Golf. This is Chuck Shaden. Are those with a day's program from WNIB Chicago at FM 97? I don't want to uh, have you think that we're rushing the uh, holiday season, the Christmas season, with some of these excerpts from the Jack Benny, Fred Allen appearances, but uh, they did appear on those command performance uh, Christmas broadcasts, and they were um, uh, excellent uh, confrontations, excellent uh, co-appearances between Jack Benny and Fred Allen. So we have another one of those for you now. This is from Christmas of 1944, uh, doing some shopping with uh, Jack and Fred, trying to figure out what to get each other for the holidays. You'll hear Bob Hope, Frank Nelson, and uh, Verna Felton in this uh, little excerpt. Runs about uh, 14 minutes. Now, gang, even though this is Christmas Day, we'd like to turn back the clock to yesterday evening and take you over to Hollywood Boulevard for a little last-minute Christmas shopping. In other words, the storm before the lull. So here we go to Hollywood Boulevard in the department store, which might also be located on State Street in Chicago, Woodward Avenue in Detroit, Flagler Street in Miami, Market Street in San Francisco, or Main Street in thousands of towns you guys come from. Take it away, department store. Pardon, uh, pardon me, sir. My name, uh, my name is Jack Benny. Jack Benny? Yes, are, are you the floor walker? Well, what do you think I am? <laughs> That's beside the point. Are you the floor walker? Where do you think I got these flat feet? At a duck farm? Oh, don't get fresh, young man. Where's the necktie counter? Aisle three to your left, but I warn you, bones are being broken over there. No worry, I can take a little shoving and pushing. Well, you could have fooled me, Daddy. <laughs> if I wasn't afraid of getting my pockets picked, I'd take one hand out and punch you right in the nose. So long, dreamboat. <laughs> so long, you old tub. Pardon me, sir. My, uh, my name is Fred Allen. Fred Allen? Yes. Uh, are you the floor walker? Oh, if I was only a rattlesnake, I'd coil up and hiss right in your face. <laughs> now hold your Cobra Chanel, bright eye. <laughs> Are you, are, you, are you the floor walker, or are you breaking that gardenia you're in for a friend? I'm the floor walker, lily pad. You think I'd spend a minute in this madhouse if I wasn't getting $18 a week in my lingerie wholesale? Well, look, if I... Am I the floor walker of all the asinine interrogations? Who do I look like, Tokyo Rose? <laughs> 
I don't care if you're the mother of the mademoiselle from Armentier. Just tell me where the necktie counter is. Aisle three, but if you expect to get through the mob, I'd suggest parachuting in. Thank you. And where are the parachutes? Sorry, only one question to a customer. I'll look around and find one myself. Now, please, please, mister. Look, I saw this tie first, and it's mine. Let go! Uh, madam, how much is this tie? Three dollars, including tax. Oh. Oh, well, you can have it, mister. Uh, say, madam, haven't you got anything, shall we say, cheaper? Don't drag me in this. <laughs> if you want something cheaper, here's something at a dollar and a half. A dollar and a half for that tie? Yes, it's hand-sewn. I don't care if Betsy Ross made it. It's too much. <laughs> you see, I'm buying this tie for a friend of mine, Fred Allen. Fred Allen? Oh, I heard him on the radio. Why didn't you just buy him a piece of rope and let him hang himself? <laughs> You mustn't talk that way. Even I wouldn't say that about Fred at Christmas time. You see, I'm Jack Benny. You are? Yep. Why don't you, you buy, buy a piece, piece of rope, rope too? too. I know. <laughs> Look, never mind the wisecracks, please. I'd like to get a tie for Alan for, well, say, in the neighborhood of 75 cents. Well, here's one for 59 cents. The new nifty hand-painted model is advertised in the Hobo News. <laughs> Say, that's a beaut. I'll take it. Okay, but the material is awful. It causes a rash on the chest. Good. <laughs> if Alan gets a rash on that hollow chest of his, it'll look like a fire in Laurel Canyon. <laughs> no kidding, his chest is so hollow, when he breathes, there's an echo. <laughs> I'll take that tie and put it in a real expensive box. How much do you want to pay for the box? Just put it in a bag. I resent that. Not you. I meant a paper bag. I see. Say, isn't that Fred Allen over there? Where? Y hey, yes, it is. He's heading this way. I'll bet that louse is going to buy me one of these cheap neckties. Listen, I'll tell you what, miss. Let me duck down behind the counter with you. Okay, but no tricks. <laughs> At your age, are you silly? <laughs> I just want to do a little spying. Well, get your head down off the counter. People will buy anything these days. <laughs> all right, all right. Yes, sir? What can I do for you? I'd like to buy a tie for an old friend. Well, here's a nice one for $3. No, you see, this fella is more old than friends. <laughs> Wait a minute, I got him. Hmm. Say, <laughs> that's just the tie I want. Your author was drafted. Say, huh? <laughs> that's, that's just the tie I want. That 59 center, the, the polka dot cheesecloth there. Okay, but I must tell you, this material causes a rash on the chest. Well, don't worry about it. The guy I'm giving this to hasn't got enough blood to break out in a rash. <laughs> Wrap it up. That's so. <laughs> This is a hot one, Mr. Allen. Not two minutes ago, I sold the same identical tie to... Ouch! What's, uh... <laughs> what is the matter... <laughs> That's a point, the point that wasn't in the script here. What's the, what's the uh, matter, miss? You jumped. Well, you jumped, too, if someone just bit your ankle. Oh. <laughs> Listen, blue eyes, that hurt. Quiet. Say, hey, what's going on behind there? Oh, ho! So it's you, Benny. Hello, Freddy. What are you... <laughs> what are you doing down there on the floor, Benny? Teaching the mice how to be rats? <laughs> No, no, Freddy. I was tired from shopping, so I thought I'd lie down for a while. Shopping, eh? That's right. Brother, you could shop from now until 1980 and still not demobilize your wallet. 
You should talk. You're tighter than the hinges on the door of Inner Sanctum. <laughs> now, don't cloud the issue. What are you doing looking at neckties? Don't you, uh, don't you crochet your own anymore? Well, to tell the truth, Freddie, between radio and pictures and managing the Jack Benny all-girl football team, I have a little time left for crocheting. That softball team, isn't it? You changed Softball, it? I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, stay now. <laughs> the Jack Benny all-girl soft football team. I'll get them both. In. That's what you get for having your bifocals on top. You see, you have... <laughs> You put them on top so you can read all the comedy lines. I know this great. <laughs> Say, I saw your team. I got the bottom one so I can see what I'm whistling at. <laughs> Go out with little women, though. Say, I saw your. I will so... be here all night, you know. <laughs> oh, that was Hope and Durante, not us. We... <laughs> I saw your team play the other night, Jackie. Who is that shortstop? Her her arms look like buggy whips, and she had no calves in her legs. That was me. My regular shortstop was home having a baby. <laughs> By the way, Freddie, what are you doing at the necktie counter? Well, I know several people with necks, so I thought I'd get them... <laughs> I thought I'd get them something to rest their Adam's apples on. Oh, well, personally, I don't see anything here that appeals to my good taste. Oh, you don't, huh? Listen, Jackson, you took up my time, picked out a tie, so hand over the 59 cents. Never mind. And you bit my ankle. Well, you can't charge me for that. I didn't like it. <laughs> Listen, Jack, did you buy one of those 59-cent dish rag foulards as a gift? Oh, it's for a friend of mine who writes a lot. I thought he might like it for a pen wiper. <laughs> I wouldn't wipe my razor on one of those. Yes, <laughs> Just wrap up one for me, too, miss, just in case. You know, Freddie, I've been wondering what to get you for Christmas. Believe me, I've combed every basement. Oh, any little thing will do, Jackie. It's not the gift. After all, it's the spirit in which it's given. That's right. You know, I like you, Fred. Well, I like you, too, Jackie Wacky. And uh, I enjoy your radio programs. You do? Uh-huh. You know, most people fall asleep when you're broadcasting. <laughs> but me, I stay awake. I don't care what people say, you're great. Well, thanks, Fred. You know another thing, Freddie? I think you're wonderful in pictures. Really? Gee, with that face of yours and those bags under your eyes, what character parts you can play? Huh? Really? Certainly, but me, all I can be is a good-looking juvenile. Oh, brother. <laughs> 20 or 30 years, I'll be washed up. But you, with those bags and wrinkles, you can go on forever. <laughs> Oh, you know, with those wrinkles, you look like a convertible with the top halfway down. You know? <laughs> oh, you're just saying that, Jack. No, no, I'm not. Why, well, you can play anything from the hunchback of Notre Dame to Dracula's other wife. <laughs> but I'm typed. All I can be is the perpetual pretty boy. Now, Jackie, don't let your beauty depress you as it does everyone else. <laughs> You are destined to be a great lover, and there's nothing you can do about it. But I'd rather be like you, Fred, a character and a great wit. Gosh, what a kick I get out of those jokes you think of. You know, those ad-libs you pull. Oh, they're really nothing. I know, but does the public realize that? <laughs> they think you're the top. Well, what the public doesn't know won't hurt us, eh, Jackie? Why, if your fans could see you in the morning before Rochester assembles you... They'd run a mile. Two miles. Say, Freddie, look, here's the music counter. I think I'll try this violin. Gosh, that's, uh... Just one second. Wait till I you, play a little exit. Are now. you playing a tuning? Yes, I will in just a second. <laughs> Ma, what time is it? <laughs> Gosh, that's beautiful, Jackie, it says here. Here, you. Put that violin down. Who do you think you are? Yosha Heifetz? Wait a minute. Why, well, listen, Heifetz. <laughs> Wait a minute. You've got Durante's glasses listen. on. You can't... Heifetz is plenty worried about me, brother. Heifetz wouldn't spit on you. Oh, he wouldn't, eh? Well, he did, smarty. <laughs> that page for anything. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, 
Now hold your temper, Jackie. And you, big boy, you're tired and overworked. This is Christmas Eve. You're just not in the mood, the proper festive mood. Say, Fred, I've got an idea. Take that banjo on the counter. We'll play a duet and give this chap a taste of the Christmas spirit. All right. Do you know, uh, do you know by any chance a song called Jingle Bells? Most of it. Most of it, Freddie. Let's go. All right. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We don't want to sound as though... We don't want to... Ready? That was a hangnail did that. I saw it. <laughs> you ready? you like our little number? I may not be Santa Claus, boys, but watch me go up that chimney. Well, we sure got a rise out of him, Jackie. Now I've got, I've got to be running along. Me too. Oh, Freddie, I almost forgot. Uh, here's a little gift. Now, don't open until tomorrow. Maybe not then. <laughs> and here, Jackie's a little gift for you. Gee, thanks. What a surprise. Merry Christmas. Well, Merry Christmas, Freddie. Merry Christmas to you, Jackie. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, stinker. <laughs> The feud continues even through the holiday season. For Fred Allen and Jack Benny there, on a broadcast excerpt from an Armed Forces Radio Command performance, Christmas Day of 1944. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program, WNIB, Chicago at FM 97. A whole afternoon today of good old sounds from Jack and Fred and some interesting supporting characters, too. We have lots more coming up, so stick around and don't touch that dial. You buy with confidence when you get the townhouse guarantee from townhouse TV and appliances. Give them a try. They won't be undersold, and you won't be underserviced. Shop around. Get the best deal possible. Then visit Townhouse. Townhouse guarantees that you'll get the best price on the hundreds of Frigidaire refrigerators, washers, dryers, and ranges in stock. And there's more. Townhouse guarantees to make delivery on the day promised. Guarantees normal installation on all products delivered. Guarantees to move your old appliance to the basement or the garage, or to remove it from the premises if you like. Check with Townhouse and take advantage of the big Townhouse guarantee. Townhouse TV and Appliances. 7243 Tui Avenue, just west of Harlem. They're open Monday, Thursday, and Friday nights till 9, Saturday until 5. We continue now with uh, Jack Benny and Fred Allen, and now we have a couple of interesting segments here. Uh, the boys were very good friends, yet they found that the feud that they kind of developed uh, was really good for uh, their ratings and for their listenership and for themselves and their programs. And so, on two different occasions, uh, Jack Benny uh, did his takeoff of the Fred Allen Show, and then Fred Allen did his takeoff on the Jack Benny program. And we have an example of each now. We go back to June the 11th of 1943 now for the Camel Comedy Caravan. It's interesting that Jack Benny would be on the Camel Comedy Caravan, even though in just a couple of years he would be sponsored by Lucky Strike Cigarettes. Uh, this is a program uh, with um, Jack and his cast, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, and Dennis Day, doing uh, their version of Fred Allen's show, taking off on Fred's uh, stroll down Allen's Alley. They call it uh, uh, Benny's Boulevard. And Jack does a very good imitation of uh, Fred Allen. An excerpt from June the 11th of 1943. And now, folks, going from the ridiculous to the nauseating. Hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Sorry I'm late, pal. I bet you thought I'd never get here. I prayed for it. <laughs> well, tell me, Phil, how do you like broadcasting on Friday for a change? I don't know. How much change am I going to get? Ha, 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 ha. That Harrison's 
phenomenal with a capital F tonight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You corny. But on the level, Phil, don't you think Sunday is a pretty blank day now that all the comedians are off for the season? What do you mean, all the comedians? Fred Allen is still broadcasting. Phil, calling Allen a comedian is like slipping a rocking chair under Gypsy Rose Lee and calling her Whistler's mother. <laughs> Alan, a comedian. Look, fellas, anybody can get laughed with that stuff Fred Allen does every week. Take that Allen's Alley, for instance. There's nothing to it. What do you mean, there's nothing to it? I mean, it's a surefire formula. Now, look, every Sunday he goes around, knocks on doors, and asks a question. I'll show you. Give me that close. Pick. What are you going to do, Jackson? I'm going to put it on my nose and make off like Fred Allen and take a trip to Benny's Boulevard. <laughs> now, Mary, you be Portland Hoppa. Dennis, I want you to be Socrates Mulligan. And Phil, you're Falstaff, the highbrow poet. All right, Mary, let's go. Wait till I get this close pin on my nose. Wait. May, 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 may. That's it. Go ahead, Mary. Start it. <laughs> Okay. Oh, Mr. Benny! Mr. Benny! Well, what is it, Seattle? <laughs> As the broom said to the dustpan, what do you hear from the mop? <laughs> I ad lib that, folks. <laughs> I'm always ad libbing. Mama says if you don't stop ad living, someday you're going to say something funny and surprise everybody. Oh, your mother. Have you got a question for Benny's Boulevard, Mr. Benny? I certainly have, Seattle, and this is it. Who is the funnier comedian, Jack Benny or Fred Allen? And here we go to Benny's Boulevard to investigate. <laughs> are at Benny's Boulevard. Is this near Allen's Alley, Mr. Benny? I can't tell. I've got this clothespin on my nose. <laughs> well, let's find out what John Doe has to say. Oh, it's you again. Good afternoon. Now tell me, Mr. Doe, do you listen to radio? Only the commercials. You know what I talk about with the seller. Well, what about the show itself that follows the commercial? Well, by the time that starts, I'm already down at the corner buying this stuff. <laughs> I see. Then you wouldn't know who's a funnier comedian, Fred Allen or Jack Benny. Nah. All I know is... E oh. <laughs> I see. Now, Seattle... <laughs> Now, Seattle, we'll see what Mrs. Nussbaum has to say. No! <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Mrs. Nussbaum, who do you think is the funniest comedian on the radio? Well, my first husband liked Abbott and Castellano. That's Costello. And my second spouse is liking Fibber McGee and Becky. I see. Well, tell me, Mrs. Nussbaum, who is your favorite comedian? Is it Jack Benny? You should live so long. <laughs> Are we going home now, Mr. Benny? What are you holding your nose for? Shall I tell him, folks? <laughs> the apple behave yourself. Now to find out what Socrates Mulligan thinks. He lives right here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm here to stew with you. Oh, 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 oh. I'm an ad-libbing fool. <laughs> now, Mr. Mulligan, I'm going to name two comedians, and you tell me which one you prefer. First, Fred Allen. Oh, he makes me laugh. And what does Jack Benny make you do? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Seattle, we're 
You're not getting any place. Try this next house, Mr. Benny. Okay. Welcome, friend. Pray do come in. Paul Staff's here, and I ain't Tim. <laughs> you ain't fat, either. Oh, 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 there I go with another ad lib. <laughs> Paul Staff, tonight? <laughs> this thing is killing me up here. <laughs> Paul Staff, tonight... <laughs> tonight we have a brand new question for you. That is pricely why I'm here. That's precisely. <laughs> pricely. I have rotten a poem. <laughs> that pricely was right. Have you heard? This isn't a blackout, Uncle Mo. You bought that hat too big. <laughs> no, no, I haven't. Or... I've saved the gloves that Mother wore when she knocked out Gunboat Smith. Now, wait a minute, Paul Staff. My question tonight is this. Who do you think is a funnier comedian, Fred Allen or Jack Benny? Allen is corny. He's nasal, he's dull. Benny's the same with no hair on his skull. But all that I asked was for you to compare us. For a socko comedian, just give me Phil Harris. Gentlemen, we wave goodbye to Benny's Boulevard as two pretty waves wave back. <laughs> this ad living will be the death of me. See what I mean, folks? <laughs> The uh, Jack Benny uh, takeoff on uh, the Fred Allen Show back on the uh, 11th of June of 1943. The Camel Comedy Caravan, a uh, summer replacement, I guess, uh, Jack and his gang uh, substituting for someone, possibly uh, Abbott and Costello back in 1943. Abbott and Costello were on there. Costello got sick and um, uh, was not able to appear, and uh, Abbott just knew he couldn't handle it alone, so they just had a bunch of substitutes come in for a while. So Jack and his gang went over there to do it uh, for Camel Cigarettes. And then uh, several years later, bang, Jack Benny was on the air for uh, Lucky Strike Cigarettes. Jack and the gang doing the takeoff on the Fred Allen show with the stroll down Benny's Boulevard. We'll have uh, uh, Fred Allen and his gang uh, doing a takeoff on the Jack Benny program in uh, just a little bit. <laughs> You'll find a generous helping of memories from and about the good old days at our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Why don't you come in and browse for a while? You'll find a complete selection of big band, personality, and soundtrack recordings, as well as those great old-time radio shows on cassettes, 8-track tape, and LP records. We offer books and magazines about the stars and the days gone by, plus nostalgic jigsaw puzzles, games, cards, gifts, and novelties. An amazing selection of memorabilia, giant one-sheet movie posters, theater lobby cards, photos, magazines. We have Riverview, theater and railroad scenes, and lots more. At our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. Our shop is open seven days a week, Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. We're open right now. We'll be open until 7.30 this evening and every Sunday afternoon from noon to 5. Come on in, see all the goodies at our good old Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. If you pop into the shop tomorrow afternoon, make sure you say hello to us. We'll be there tomorrow, and so will Chuck Voldarsik, who wrote the complete photo history book about Riverview. He put it all together. It's called Riverview, 1904 to 1967, gone but not forgotten. He will be there tomorrow to sign uh, copies, autographed copies of his book, which is available at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, only $9.95. Chuck will also be at our memory club tonight. Chuck Voldarsik will, so will Chuck Shaden. Chuck uh, Voldarsik will be at the memory club tonight with copies of his book to autograph them if you like to. So I uh, get a couple chances this weekend to get your very own copy of the uh, Riverview uh, book and get it uh, autographed by the author in person. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Womat, 
Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where you'll find quality merchandise for the entire family. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Shop and save seven days a week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center in Wilmette. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program uh, coming your way every Saturday afternoon from 1 to 5 on WNIB Chicago FM 97. Earlier uh, this afternoon we heard the last regularly scheduled uh, Fred Allen program from uh, 1949. In 1950, Fred uh, was a, uh, an irregular regular on The Big Show, the uh, uh, radio broadcast from the 1950s that uh, brought in all the stars and uh, had everybody doing uh, variety numbers and things like that. It was a 90-minute show on uh, NBC. The first program in that series was November 5th of 1950, and they had a lot of people there to celebrate the opening of the big show. Tulula Bankhead was the hostess, the uh, MC, Mistress of Ceremonies. On this segment, we have uh, Fred Allen uh, in uh, as a guest on the big show. He was a guest on the first big show. Fred Allen, Portland Hoffa, Danny Thomas, Jimmy Durante, Meredith Wilson, and Frankie Lane. And, uh, of course, to Little Bankhead, too. They're all here doing a, a Fred Allen version of the Jack Benny program, which Fred calls the Pinch Penny program. Fred, my darling. Oh, you fool. Oh, yeah. It's so nice to have you back on radio. I've missed you. Oh, so you are the one. <laughs> According to Hooper, you are the one. No, darling, we've all missed you. Why don't you come back, Fred? Well, I'll tell you, darling. I, uh... <laughs> I have been dabbling in something which, for the want of a better name, we shall call television. Please, darling, people are eating. <laughs> I'm sorry. Say, so you didn't by any chance happen to see me on my first television show, did you? No, I didn't, Fred. Uh, oh, you weren't home? Oh, oh, yes, I was home, darling. Oh, no set, darling? No guts, darling. <laughs> well, you know television's a new media, and I have discovered why they call it a media, because nothing is well done, or very little. <laughs> Darling, I think you're so funny. So you are the one. <laughs> no, Fred. No, ser uh, seriously speaking, darling. Well, as if we haven't been. What else? Well, we no, no, no. Why did you leave radio? Well, I'll tell you, uh, Tallulah. They wanted me to do one of those programs where you call up people on the telephone and ask them questions and give them prizes, you see. And that's why I quit and went into television. Do you mean? Yes, it was a choice between the medium and the telephone. <laughs> Wait for love. Oh, excuse no, me. No, I'm don't, uh, don't, uh, don't read the stuff in parenthesis. You skip oh, that. Oh, I'm sorry, That's Fred, I'm sorry. Well, well, anyway, I, I'm glad I was able to get you back on radio, even if it is only as a guest. Uh-huh. You know, when they told me about this big-name broadcast, I told them it wouldn't be a big-name broadcast without you, Fred. Well, in radio, Fred has been a four-letter word for some time. <laughs> In fact, I insisted that they put you on this show. Well, you insisted? You met with some uh, stiff opposition, did you? Well, I had to go through channels. Oh, I say, I've read about those channels, but I had thought of coming to back to radio if I could find a new formula, a format, you know. I did get one idea, and strangely enough, it came from Portland. She seemed to think that if I... Uh... Mr. Allen! Well... Mr. Allen! Well, as I stand here and feign surprise, uh, if it isn't Portland now. Uh, Portland, Georgia, I had some more here. See, it, we didn't rehearse the audience. It says applause after this, but you see, it's a rehearsal. This is what's mixing things. Portland, you're just in time. This is Tallulah Bankhead. Uh, hello, Portland. I'm glad to see you. How do you do, sir? <laughs> Portland. I understand that you weren't on the first television show Fred did. Why was that? But my dress wasn't cut low enough. Oh. <laughs> you, you mean a dress with a V-neck? A T-V-neck. Uh, well, before this conversation gets too fay, uh, Portland... <laughs> Portland, how about telling Tallulah the idea you thought up for a radio show for me? Oh, I didn't think of it. Uh, Mama thought of it. Oh, your mother is writing for radio now? 
Well, uh, by the way, I was on television the other night, Portland. Did your mother see me? Oh, she never could. Uh. <laughs> you mean that your mother thinks that I... As Mama put it, to the high heavens. <laughs> Lib a stinging retort. Fred, you're reading the parenthesis. Oh, the parenthesis, this jumbo type. Oh, well, yes, well, Portland, enough of Mama as a George G. Nothing. Now, how about, how about this idea of hers for a radio show? Uh, yes, let's hear the idea. The idea. Well, for... Mama thought first you ought to have an announcer who is big and fat and jolly yeah. and laughs all through the program. Yep, sit up, huh? And you ought to get an orchestra leader who's tall, good looking, and eats ham hocks. Ham hocks. Well, say, Portland, that sounds like a... Uh... And you have a young fellow who sings, and his mother always wants you to pay him more money. Singer, but Portland, that idea... And you have a butler who drives your car, which is a broken-down Maxwell. Maxwell, but... And you have a quartet that sings your commercial... Commercial, but... And for your sponsor, you get a cigarette company. Cigarette, but... <laughs> show, Mr. Oh, Allen. Really? I can be in it, too, uh -huh. huh? You yeah. wear a toupee, yeah. you're always 39 years old, uh -huh. you play a violin, and you do your own laundry, yeah. and you have a washing machine that you rent out to your neighbors, Say. and you're very tight, and you keep your money down in a ball. I'm sort of the pinch penny type, huh? Yes, and that's a wonderful title. You could call it the Pinch Penny Program. Well, I don't know, Portland. What's the future in becoming a salesman for Jell-O? I mean, where could you go? Well, what's the matter? Do you think Mama's idea revolutionary? Well, it is a little revolting. <laughs> what do you think, Miss Bankhead? You haven't had any lines for a whole page. I was wondering when you'd notice, darling. <laughs> do you think that kind of a program would go anywhere? Yes, darling, to another network. <laughs> right now, Mr. Allen. No, no, I don't think I could... But, uh... Mr. Allen, what have you got to lose? Face. <laughs> An excellent reason for doing it, darling. Now, so on with the Pinch Penny program. Pinch Penny. <laughs> program. <laughs> 30 minutes of hijinks with your favorite radio comedian, star of stage, screen, and laundry, Pinch Penny. Well, here it is, 7 o'clock, and Pinch Penny isn't here yet. I wonder where he can be. Say, that always gets me. There's a guy who gets $25,000 a week for doing that program, and you know he's not going to be late. He's probably been standing there since noon with his bare money belt hanging out. <laughs> Try another opening. Could you scare up another opening? Okay. Well, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first show of the new season. And so we give you the star of our show just back from an extended three-month, 40-cent tour of Radio City, Pinch Penny. Hello again. <laughs> Hello again. This is Pinch Penny. And Don Thomas, you know that's not true. You know I took a cruise to Honolulu. It was a wonderful boat trip. Really? How did you go, Mr. Penny? First class? Well, not exactly. Uh, second class? Well, no, you see... Uh, third class? Well, no, Don Z. Oh, then you must have gone steerage. Steerage? Why, Don, how can you say that about me? <laughs> it's easy. Uh, <laughs> didn't you, uh find it pretty crowded down in steerage? Don, for your information, I'll have you know that I had the whole boat to myself. Uh, what boat was that? Well, it was one of those little boats that hangs over the side of the big boat. <laughs> oh, so you went stowaway. Yes, that's the class I was trying to think of. And it's the only way to travel, Don, with the wind and the spray in my hair. Yeah. Uh, your hair, Mr. Penny? Well, I had it hanging over the side of the boat. <laughs> now stop that, Don. Uh, did you like Honolulu? Oh, it's so colorful there. And I'll never forget the day we docked. All the little native boys standing on the pier and the people on the boat throwing pennies into the water and the way those little rascals dive in and fight to get that money. They go to all that trouble for pennies? Well, after all, all done, it's not taxable. No inheritance tax or anything. Liquid assets, you know, just as now, you pick it out. Now, now, Mr. Penny, don't tell me that you... Now, uh, Don, please, after all, say, where is everybody? Where's Dennis? 
I want to talk to Dennis about his song for our first show. Oh, here he is. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Don. Mr. Penny, my mother thinks... Hello, Dennis. My mother thinks I ought to get more money for this new season. I said hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Penny. My mother thinks I ought to get more money for this new season. Now, later, later, kid. Now, look, for your first song this year... My mother thinks I'm underpaid. Your mother doesn't know what she's talking about. Now, for your... Ooh, what you said. <laughs> now, for your first song... My mother is the brains of the family. Some brains. Now, look, kid, for your first song... She was an honor graduate from the University of Southern California. Come louder. I say she was an honor graduate from the University of... Now, cut that out. I pay you ample salary. You mean sample. <laughs> My mother says that Bing Crosby makes as high as $50 a week and sometimes 75 Well, Bing Crosby has a lot of interest. He's in the orange juice business. He owns a baseball club. Where does he find the time for all that? He makes movies. He runs a racetrack. Where does he find the time for all that? He has four sons. Where does he find the time? Yes. <laughs> Where? Well, my mother either says I get money or I'll quit. Well, goodbye, darling. I mean, goodbye. I mean, goodbye, Dennis. Every time I open my mouth to quit, somebody says goodbye, darling. All right, goodbye. And my mother says she's going to send you back these pennies you sent from Honolulu. Well. <laughs> Mr. Penny, you don't mean you dole for pennies with those kids in Honolulu. Well, the water was so delightfully warm, Darcy. And now I am in a spot. Where is everybody, Mr. Penny? We gotta have a rehearsal of the show. Well, Portchester should be here any minute with the scripts. Oh, here's Portchester now. Oh, yes. Hello, Portchester. Hello, Bo. <laughs> now, now, look, darling. I mean, uh, Portchester. Did you, did you, did you finish typing the scripts? Yes, Bo, but I had a lot of trouble. It's tough to write on a typewriter with, with only five keys on it. Only five letters on that typewriter? Well, what's the matter with that? I've done very well with those five letters. So what five letters are they, Porchester? L, S, M, F, and T. <laughs> well, it's like sending up smoke signals. Well, it's a Corona typewriter, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Penny, I, I think you're the funniest. Oh, so you're the one. <laughs> Well, I wish the rest of the cast would get here so we could rehearse. Well, well, Mr. Penny, I have the quartet here if you want to run over the commercial. Commer we have no commercial. This is a sustaining program. But they've already rehearsed it, Mr. Penny, haven't you, fellas? But, but... But, fellas, we don't need a quartet. We have no commercial. Okay, fellas, let them hear it. But, fellas... S-U-S-T-A-I-N-I-N-G, we're sustaining NBC. S-U-S-T-A-I-N-I-N-G Who's sustaining old TV? But fellas S-U-S-T-A-I-N-I-N-G All the stars are Boys, men Quiet! Quiet! Now look Wet! Another well and I'll strike oil I haven't got time for that now. I'm waiting for my clarinet teacher. He's supposed to be here. I'm going to call him up and see what's keeping him. Hand me that phone, will you, Porchester? Here you are, Bo. Thank you. Hello? Hello, operator? What is the matter with those girls out there? Mindy, blue eyes is flashing. <laughs> Did he give you a present when he got back from his vacation? Yeah, he gave me a locket. Ain't it a beauty? Oh, yeah, an Indian head. <laughs> but it's nice, though, isn't it? Oh, they're a dime a dozen. Oh, not these. They've gone up. They're ten for a dime. But instead of bringing me expensive gifts, I sure wish he'd stop making up new rules. Oh, Mindy, you're always telling me about your troubles. I have troubles, too, but you never ask me how I'm getting along. All right, Ethel. How are you getting along? Don't ask. <laughs> hey, how are you getting along with Herman? Don't ask. Gee, I thought he was going to take you out Saturday night. Didn't ask. 
Why? I thought he had intentions. Oh, sure he's got intentions, but he don't want to get married. <laughs> oh, man. You sure got to hand it to him. Not Herman. He takes it himself. <laughs> What's his name? You know, Harry Oh, I could never marry him Why not? Well, we used to ride home on the subway together And I got off on 34th Street And he got off on 23rd Street So what? So I realized I could never marry a man below my station <laughs> Say, Ethel, he's flashing again Maybe we ought to answer Hello, hello, yes, hello Say, what's going on out there? I want you to get my clarinet teacher on the phone for me And tell him to come right down here What? Oh, all right. I'll give you one, too. Gold diggers, copper diggers, Indian heads she wants. Yeah. I'm back, Mr. Penny. My mother changed my mind. Oh, she did. But this is going to be my last season because for next year, my mother's got me a contract with Metro Golden Mayor for $1,000 a week. A thousand? Oop. <laughs> <laughs> Where? <laughs> That's right, a thousand a week. MGM signed a contract with you? Ooh, signed. Now cut that out. That's no fair. Meredith Harris is here. Well, it's about time. It's about... <laughs> it's about time you showed up. Where were you? Now, take it easy, Dad. I'm here, ain't I? Where was you, he asked me. Where, uh, where was you? I said, where were you? Okay, if you're going to get geometrical about it. Well, ain't we dandy. If I'd have known, I'd have brung you an apple. It's not brung, it's broad. Ah, tell it to the morons. <laughs> what goes around here? How about the rehearsal? Uh, you'll have to wait until we get through with my clarinet lesson. Until my teacher comes, I think I'll do a little practicing. Mm -hmm. My teacher will be here any minute. He comes uh, by bus, so it'll take a little while for him to get here. <laughs> I think I'll get down and have an ice cream soda. I think I'll get down, too. I'll have an ice cream soda with you. I'm going down, too. I can't stand any more of this. Well, come with us. You're going to have a soda? Yeah. I always take one jigger of soda. Got to leave plenty of room for that good stuff on top. Cowards. <laughs> back again, are you, Portland? Well, tell me, what did your mother think of the way uh, we took off that Sterling character she originated for radio? Well, Mr. Allen, she doesn't think it's your type of program. Oh, really? She has another fellow in mind for Mr. it. Uh, Mr. Livingston, I presume? <laughs> well, she has got a wonderful idea that would just fit you. Oh, another idea, really? Uh -huh. She thinks you ought to have a program where you walk down an alley yeah. and you talk to people you meet there, yeah. like a southern congressman, uh -huh. an old farmer, and an Irishman. And you tell and... a lot of old, sure file jokes and find myself broadcasting at the same time everybody else is listening to a quiz program someplace. I know what you mean, Paul, and I'm not going through that again. No, sir, I'm not going through that again. He's been there, huh? <laughs> Fred Allen uh, on the big show. An excerpt from the first program in that series from November 5th of 1950 with uh, Tallulah Bankhead and a whole bunch of folks who uh, had appeared on that show at that time uh, in their own specialties, too, joining in on the, the Pinch Penny program. We will have a complete Jack Benny program coming up for you in just a little bit with uh, uh, Dennis Day, Phil Harris, Rochester, Mary Livingston, Don Wilson, and uh, guest uh, Fred Allen. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. Hey kids, have you heard the latest? The new Kid Power Gang are wearing those super looking sneakers with a steel shank for good support, and that prevents the sole from sagging. Kid Power sneakers available at the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, 2924 Central Street in Evanston. They're made from comfortable suede and sharp looking nylon. They wear well, but are reasonably priced. Colors are blue, red, or green. So be in style. Go to the Paul Meyer Shoe Store, 2924 Central Street in Evanston, and get some cool, swift sneakers. Kid Power. They swing. 
Now we're going to swing into a sound from our cassette tape of the month for the month of September. Listen to this. Suspense. Columbia's parade of outstanding thrillers produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. I'm very happy I am to be back in the United States and back on the Columbia Network, even for so short a visit as this one. Back with old friends like Johnny Dietz, who's tonight's director, and Bernard Herman. The Mercury Theater presented tonight's radio play for the first time last year. We came right out then and hailed it as a classic of the medium. Nobody argued the point. A lot of people asked us to do it again, so it's gratifying to get the chance now and to find a favorite of ours in this distinguished anthology of spook shows. Personally, I've never met anybody who didn't like a good ghost story, but I know a lot of people who think there are a lot of people who don't like a good ghost story. For the benefit of these, at least, I go on record at the outset of this evening's entertainment with a sober assurance that although blood may be curdled on this program, none will be spilt. There's no shooting, knifing, throttling, axing, or poisoning here. No clanking chains, no cobwebs, no bony and or hairy hands appearing from secret panels or, better yet, bedroom curtains. If it's any part of that dear old phosphorescent foolishness that people who don't like ghost stories don't like, then again, I promise you, we haven't got it. Not tonight. What we do have is a thriller. It's half as good as we think it is. You can call it a shocker. It's already been called a real Orson Welles story. Now, frankly, I don't know what this means. I've been on the air directing and acting in my own shows for quite a while now, and I don't suppose I've done more than half a dozen thrillers in all that time. Honestly, I don't think even that many, but it seems I do have a reputation for the uncanny, quite possibly a little escapade of mine involving a couple of planets, which shall be nameless, is responsible doesn't really matter. Don't think I disapprove of thrillers. I don't. A story doesn't have to appeal to the heart. It can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warmed, and sometimes you want your spine to tingle. The tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to The Hitchhiker. That's the name of our story, The Hitchhiker. And what a story it is, too. You'll find it on our cassette tape of the month for September. Orson Welles starring in just about taking over the suspense program on The Hitchhiker. And that's only half of what we have for you on our tape for September. We also have Raymond, our host, opening the screeching door of the inner sanctum in a fine story called The Judas Clock. It's a full hour of thrills and chills from radio's classic mystery dramas. Our cassette for September, Inner Sanctum, and suspense. Only $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. The uh, suspense drama is from September 2nd of 1942, the Inner Sanctum Mystery from April 17th of 1945. 60 minutes of great radio entertainment, all yours on a single hour-long cassette tape from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. You can pick up your tape at any of the five offices of Northwest Federal Savings or when you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road. Get two new shows for your good old collection, Suspense plus Inner Sanctum, our cassette tape of the month for September. $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. I'm Chuck Shaden. Uh, this is our Those Were the Days program on WNIB. That's at FM 97 on your Chicago radio dial. And we have uh, Jack Benny and Fred Allen, superstars, with us this afternoon. We're going back now to May 19th of 1946. This is the Jack Benny program, a complete show now, sponsored originally by Lucky Strike Cigarettes. We've left the cigarette commercials intact for historical reference. It was heard on the National Broadcasting Company in the mid-1940s, as I say, 1946. The guest on this show is uh, Fred Allen, broadcasting from New York. 
Jack mostly broadcast from Hollywood, but when he went to New York, if he were there for any length of time at all, he would certainly want to get Fred Allen in on the, uh, on the show as a guest. And uh, Fred turns up in the second segment of this. Let's listen now to the first portion of the Jack Benny program. The Jack Benny Program. American. Quality of product is essential to continuing success. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. LSMFT. 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 Right you are. Yes, sir. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. Mr. Lawrence Holland Moore of Shelby, North Carolina, who has been an independent tobacco buyer for 28 years, said, Year after year, at auction after auction, I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy ripe, sweet tobacco, the kind that makes a really good smoke. I've smoked Lucky's myself for 23 years. Independent tobacco experts like Mr. Moore know that it takes fine tobacco to make a fine smoke, and Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So for your own real deep-down smoking enjoyment, smoke that smoke of fine tobacco... Lucky Strike. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. that body of land that was purchased from the Indians for $24, we bring you a man who could have gotten it for $22.50. And here he is, Jack Benny. Thank you. <laughs> it's going to be hard to work and look at that face over there. Hello again, this is Jack Betty talking, and Don, I can't tell you how thrilled I am being in New York. Oh, I know just how you feel, Jack. In fact, the moment we arrived in town and I saw the reception we got, my chest swelled out with pride. Don, from where I stand, your stomach is even prouder than your chest. <laughs> but there's something about this city that's different. No matter how many times you come to New York, you get a feeling of expansion, of growth. The trees look taller, the buildings look taller, even the mayor looks taller. <laughs> It's amazing. Now, wait a minute, Jack. The mayor is taller. What? You mean LaGuardia found out about Adler Shoe? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Jack, no. LaGuardia isn't mayor anymore. New York has a new one now. Oh, really? No, O'Dwyer. Die. <laughs> now, wait. Let's not, steal, let's not steal jokes from Danny Kaye. You know, I've got four writers. Oh, really? No, O'Para, no Balzer, no Tackerberry, and no Gilson. <laughs> Now, where were we? Well, I was just telling you that O'Dwyer is a lot taller than LaGuardia. Well, maybe he is, Don, but after he chases fire engine for 12 years, his legs will be worn down, too, <laughs> believe me. So you never can tell... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, everybody. Mary, I was just telling Don how thrilled I am being back in New York. Well, I don't blame you, Jack. Yes, sir. There's something about New York that's invigorating. Why, the minute I got off the train at the station, I felt stronger. Is that why you put on a red cap and carried your own bag? <laughs> I just did that for a laugh. A laugh? And how come you went back and carried somebody else's bag? When I get a laugh, I'm not letting it go, sister. <laughs> and anyway, those other bags belong to a very important man. Oh, really? No, Dwyer, and shut up. <laughs> Hey, Mary, have you been having any fun in New York? Uh-huh, but I've been spending most of my time in New Jersey visiting my mother. Oh, yes, yes, your mother. How is the William Bendix of Plainfield? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mama's fine, but really? Papa's having a lot of trouble getting up the stairs. Why? Mama keeps throwing him down. Oh. <laughs> Sounds a little like Titus Moody in there, that one. I can understand. Anyway, Mary, how's the rest of your folks? I mean, how's your sister, Babe? she get married yet? No, Jack, and Babe's heartbroken about it. You know, last week she was going to elope with a new boyfriend. And what happened? She couldn't get the ladder up to his window. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Yeah, so she threw him a rope. Oh, that's good. No, he rope. Oh, that's good. No, he took another look at Babe and hung himself. Took another look at Babe and hung himself. <laughs> There's a sister right over there. <laughs> Oh, 
that's too bad. Huh? No, that's good. Now she's engaged to the Undertaker. Oh, really? No, Shapiro. <laughs> I'm merely asking how you folks are. You make a whole mishmash out of it. Yes, and the people who tune in late didn't mishmash. Oh. Every time we come to New York, you... Hey, Mr. Benny, I'd like to have you meet a friend of mine. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello. Hey, Mr. Benny, I'd like to have you meet a friend how of mine. How you doing, kid? Fine. Hey, Mr. Benny, I'd like to have you meet you a friend of mine. You having a good time in New York? I sure am. Me and this friend of mine went out all over town and we had a lot of fun. I showed him how to jump over fire plugs and he showed me how to hitch rides on the back of trolley cars. I don't know where you pick up. Where is your friend? Right out in the hall. I'll go and get him. Dennis and his friend. They married. Here he is, Mr. Benny. Isn't he cute? Dennis, they found the other 499 monkeys. Take this one back to the pet. <laughs> Imagine picking up a... Quiet. Imagine picking up a monkey for a friend. No wonder he was teaching Dennis how to hitch rides in the back of trolley cars. I fell off twice. What? I couldn't hang by my tail. <laughs> Dennis, stop being ridiculous. Where'd you meet this monkey? Well, I was walking along and I saw him standing on the corner waiting for a light to change. Oh, for heaven's sake. Mary, tonight after the show... Oh, so I took him by the hand and helped him across the street. All right, all right. Mary, tonight after the show... Then me. I started to sing and before I knew it, we had $40 in nickels. <laughs> $40 in nickels? Monkey. Just trying to take him out of the upper bracket. He is kind of cute. Come here, monkey. Goody, goody, goo. Goody, goo. Oh, look, it jumped up on me. Dennis, quick, get the monkey off Jack's shoulder. No, no, he's all right. Well, at least move his tail. You look like Jerry Colonna. <laughs> Jerry Colonna? What's the matter? You crazy or something? Dennis! Take it easy, monkey. Just sit on my shoulder. Hiya, folks. Harris is here. I couldn't get a room, so I slept last night with Grant in his tomb. <laughs> Lay it on me. Make with that New York patty cake. <laughs> hey, Jackson, what's that thing you got on your shoulder? Well, it's a monkey, a real live monkey. Come on, get down. Well, what do you know? Where'd you get it, Jackson? It isn't mine. Uh, Dennis picked it up last night. Isn't that silly? I don't know. It looks better than what you picked up the night before. <laughs> oh, yeah? She was a pretty classy dame. Yeah, yeah. Say, uh, were those her legs or were her stockings filled with walnuts? <laughs> Bill, one more crack like that and you're going back to California. When's the train leaving? I don't know. I'll call Truman and find out. <laughs> So watch it. Say, Phil, have you seen any shows since we got to town? Yeah, Libby, I saw Are You With It. Are You With It? That's the show that two Jack Riders wrote. I saw it 12 times. 12 times? Jack's got the candy confession there. <laughs> lemonade, lemonade. <laughs> I'm down to my last sugar stamp, too. Oh, well. What other shows have you seen, Mr. Benny? Uh, Call Me Mister. I did. Call Me Mister is the name of a show. <laughs> what happened to Are You With It? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> Dennis, you're getting dumber every day. Take last week with the quiz kids. Such confidence. You came to me and said, don't worry, Mr. Benny. I'll pull you through to ultimate victory. That's right, Dennis. And we ought to thank Mary. She's the one that pulled us through to ultimate. <laughs> Bill, that's ultimate victory. Ultimate is an adjective. Why not? <laughs> Bill, if I thought for a minute that this monkey could lead an orchestra, I know who would go back to the pet shop. Now, come on, Dennis. Let's have your song, will you?
never let you go. Your eyes will tell me all I want to know. Now that I'm gone, I've a by Dennis Day, accompanied by Phil Harris's orchestra, which was conducted by Dennis Day's friend who used his tail for a baton. <laughs> and very good. And now, you're welcome. And now, folks, if my mother knew I was doing this, she'd kill me. <laughs> I won't tell her, Bob. That's our, uh, that's our producer. We made him a monkey for today. <laughs> very few producers can be monkeys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the uh, comedy on the Jack Benny program from May the 19th of 1946. Uh, Jack's guest Fred Allen will show up in the next segment of this program, originally sponsored by Lucky Strike Cigarettes. Chuck Shaden, those were the days, WNIB, Chicago FM 97. Have you been giving some thought to selling your home and uh, moving to another? Ever wonder what your present home is worth? Why don't you call Frank Lamphere at Antique Realty, 5852 West Diversey. He's a certified appraiser and a licensed real estate broker. He'll be happy to give you a good idea of the current market value of your home. He'll show you comparable properties in your neighborhood and discuss the factors which will contribute to a realistic selling price for your property. And there's no cost or obligation. If you're interested in selling now or if you simply want a point of reference for future use, give a call to Antique Realty, 889-3840. They've had years of experience servicing northwest Chicago and suburbs. A large part of their business comes from repeat customers and referrals. Antique Realty is a member of the Northwest Multiple Listing Service with more than 130 offices ready to help sell your home to the right buyer. It's a seller's market, and if you're thinking of selling, now is the time to go to market. Call or visit Antique Realty. With a red and white striped canopy out front, lots of antique furnishings inside. 5852 West Diversity Avenue, just east of Austin. Antique Realty for good, old-fashioned, personalized service. Ole! The new Ford Fiesta is here, and you can see it at Nelson Hirschberg Ford, 5133 West Irving Park Road. Yes, Ford's new mini car is not just another new car. It's a whole new kind of car, combining Ford's worldwide resources. The Fiesta is produced in Germany where it's built to the traditionally exacting standards of German craftsmen. The new Fiesta delivers exceptional fuel economy and rack and pinion steering and a tight turning radius give the Fiesta excellent maneuverability in city driving. You've got to see it to believe it. And when you see it, you'll love it. See the new Ford Fiesta at Nelson Hirschberg Ford where they want your business today and tomorrow too. Nelson Hirschberg Ford, one of Chicagoland's oldest, most respected Ford dealers. 5133 West Irving Park Road at Laramie. They're open Monday through Friday till 9, Saturday and Sunday until 5. And now we continue with our uh, salute to the superstars, Fred, Ellie, Fred Allen and uh, Jack Benny, as we go back to the 19th of May in 1946, a Sunday night for the last segment, a good 17 minutes worth of the Jack Benny program. And now, folks, for our feature attraction tonight... Oh, Don, Don, would you mind answering the phone? Oh, certainly not. 
Hello, this is John Wilson talking for Jack Benny, the star of the Lucky Strike program. L.S., M.F.T., L.S., M.F.T. Yes, sir, you bet. Don, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, so round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. Don, find out what the man wants. Lucky Strikes are made of that fine, that light, that naturally mild tobacco. Don, it might be important. It's a phone For call. real find deep down the smoking man. enjoyment, smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strikes. What? Oh, I'm sorry. You have the wrong number. <laughs> Don, the next time you answer the phone, ask who it is first, then, you know, tell them all about Lucky Strikes and everything, you know? And now, folks... Oh, Don, it's... Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. That's my writer. He's from Brooklyn. Everybody works on the show. Uh, take it. Uh, take it. Take it, Mary. Here you are, boy. Here's a tip for you. Oh, boy, a glass of lemonade. <laughs> You'll suffer. You wrote that joke yourself, Mary. I just happen to have one in my pocket, the lemonade. I'm going back to that. Uh, who's the uh, Who's the telegram from, Mary? Fred Allen. Fred Allen? What does it say? Uh, dear Jack, I am expecting you as a guest on my program next Sunday. I'm sure you'll be there, as I haven't had any luck all season. Hmm. Isn't that, isn't that sarcastic? Sounds like an adjective. Dennis. <laughs> But imagine the nerve of Alan after he came over to my hotel and pleaded with me, begged me, even offered me money to be a guest on his show. Then he sends a wire like this. Jack, Jack, do you mean that Alan came to your hotel and begged you to be on his program? Oh, Don, I, I don't even want to discuss it. I'll tell you what happened, Don. Mary, please. I happened to be over at Jack's hotel, the Acme Plaza. 500 rooms, three baths. Mary. And I thought nylon lines were long. <laughs> now, Mary... When I got into the hotel lobby, the elevator wasn't working, so I had to walk down four flights of stairs to get to Jack's room. Mary, they're not interested in this thing. Anyway, I got through talking to Jack and was just about to leave. Jack? What do you want me to come by your room for? Well, you know, we're going home next week, Mary, and I want to take something back for my girlfriend, Gladys Abisco. Uh, what would you suggest? Well, why don't you get her a nice beaver coat? No, 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 that's, that's too expensive. Well, how about a nice sealskin coat? No, no, that, that's a little too expensive, too. Why don't you just get her a rowboat and a harpoon and let her do her own shopping? <laughs> I did that once. She got seasick. I'll tell you what, Mary, just pick out anything you like. You know, you'll know what to get. No jewelry or fur. I know, I know. Goodbye. All right, so long. Be careful going up the stairs. Yeah, I hope Mary picks out something nice. Oh, boy, if I feel the job for you. Thanks, Rochester. Yes, sir. Have you got everything ready for my bath? Yes, sir. Towel, soap, talcum powder, bath mat, bath robe, bath soap, and your two little celluloid ducks. Fine, fine. And, Rochester, I didn't think it was a bit funny last Saturday night when you put tacks in the bottom of the bathtub. So were bath soap. Oh. They haven't disintegrated yet. Disintegrated? That's a bird. Oh. oh. <laughs> well, they were sharp as an adjective. Well, I think I'll go in for my bath now. See you later. So I've gone to this hotel room, sure as a mess. That was some party the boss threw last night. Coca-Cola flew like wine. Mm-hmm. I've never seen the boss so merry. He slapped his sponsor on the back so hard he swallowed his cigarette. Lucky strike, that is. <laughs> and when Mr. Benny got up and told that story about the octopus, I thought I'd... I wonder who that can be. Come in. Hello, Rochester. Is Mr. Benny in? Well, it's Alan. <laughs> Come right in, Mr. Allen. Mr. Benny's taking a bath. He'll be out in a few minutes. Well, I'll wait for him. How is Mr. Benny feeling, I hope? Pretty good. <laughs> That is, considering the big party he threw last night. Mr. Benny threw a party? Yeah, the atomic bomb, and now this. <laughs> what, uh, what was Gromico's reaction, Rochester? 
tell me, was the party a success? Yeah, what a soiree. There was sandwiches, music, and dancing. Well, it's a soiree. That's a conjunction, isn't it? <laughs> well, it sounds, as, it sounds as though everybody had a good time. Yeah, Mr. Benny enjoyed himself so much, he said next time he might invite girls. <laughs> oh, it was a stag party. Uh, up until 11 o'clock, then the night maid came on. <laughs> Well, that's Benny, the chambermaid's pin-up boy. <laughs> He's just as democratic as ever. Failure hasn't gone to his head. Say, <laughs> uh, Rochester, will you tell Mr. Benny I'm here? Yes, sir. Why don't you just sit down and make yourself comfortable? Here's one of Mr. Benny's favorite books. I stand condemned. Oh, I... That's the story about the man who goes to the electric chair and leaves three lovely children, cream, cheese, and bagel. I hear Lindy selected it as the book of the month. They give you a smoke herring for a bookmark. With the quarter size, they give you an anchovy bookmark. I well, Rochester, I'm through ad-libbing. You can tell Mr. Benny to come out now. He'll come out just as soon as he can think of something funny to say. <laughs> well, I can't wait that long. <laughs> Tell him to come out in pantomime, if you will. Yes. Uh oh, what? You got company. Oh, where's that? You'll be fine. I'll be off in a minute. Rochester, what are you? Well, Fred, Fred Allen. Hello, Jack. I was just taking a bath. Well, that's good, Jack. I think everyone should have a hobby. <laughs> yeah, you want to know something, Fred? Those pens do write underwater. I found that. Uh, boys, you better put your robe on. You'll catch cold with just that towel around you. Oh, I'll be all right. Gosh, Jack, you've, uh, you've gotten sort of fat, haven't you? Don't be funny. <laughs> Your hips have jowls, I know. <laughs> well, Ozzy, Fred, you haven't changed a bit. Same hair, same forehead, same eyebrows, same eyes. Fred, lift those bags a little. I want to see your teeth. <laughs> Put on your red cap and lift them yourself. <laughs> I will not. Fred, what's the reason for this friendly visit? Well, Jack, hang on to your towel. I've come to ask you to be a guest on my radio program. Oh. Well, gee, Fred, I'd love to be a guest on your show, but I can't. I already have a date for Wednesday night. For your... For Wednesday night? Yes. Yeah. For your information, Mr. B, I do my broadcast on Sunday night right after yours. And when the wind is from the opposite direction, I must say I don't mind it at all. <laughs> what did you say? If you'll take that celluloid duck out of your ear, you'd hear me. Oh, oh. Well, Fred, give me the details about going on your program. Well, Jack, I thought as long as you were, were here in town, you might like to appear on my show. Get in off of the street for a little while someday. <laughs> well, listen, if you're going to have live, do it on your own show where you need it. <laughs> you can use it, too, don't forget it. You could have used me ten minutes ago. I was listening. Really? <laughs> If we keep on much longer, McCarthy will be on, make a monkey out of both of us. <laughs> That's one-eighth, uh, that is. <laughs> of course, uh, about coming on the show, I'm willing to pay you. Pay me? Uh, yes, stop trembling and pick up your towel. Oh. <laughs> well, look, Fred. <laughs> Fred, as long as this is a business proposition, let's discuss it. Sit down. Here, have a cigarette. Thank you. Have a tea bag. <laughs> Oh, boy, my favorite brand. Now, Fred, guess what makes you think I'd consider appearing on your program? Well, I saw your ad in the Hobo News. <laughs> my ad? Yes, the ad that read, Now in Town, Jack Benny. Available for theatrical dates, guest star appearances, and for two shillings, we'll meet English brides at the dock if husbands are detained. <laughs> Must be seen portal to portal pay. 
Oh, that ad? <laughs> that was just putting the papers as a gag by my press agent. Yeah? That gag killed him in Chicago and paid Mr. Bennett's band in New York. Rogers, I didn't know you were still here. In a one-room suite, where else could I be? Well, Mr. Allen and I are having a private conversation. Now, Fred, let's get back to business. Well, Jack, I'm stuck. I had another guest for next week, but she couldn't make it. Uh, who was this other guest? The one that and he who still hasn't had a joke on the whole program. <laughs> you reading the wrong line to straight line? <laughs> The, uh, my guest is the one and only Marcella Crudney. Marcella Crudney? Yes. You haven't heard of her? She's with the New York Yankees. You see, the Yankees have a pitcher whose specialty is the spitball. On hot summer days, when the pitcher might uh, run dry, Marcella stands by... Oh, her! Yes, her. her. But uh, she was suspended for spraying an umpire. Marcella was at work as Zephyr came up, and need I say more... Anyway, Jack, when Marcella couldn't make it, I tried to get John Charles Fido, the singing dog. But he had laryngitis. I see. So you finally got down to me. Down is right. <laughs> Why in the world did you ever take a hotel room that's so far underground as this? Oh, Fred, my room isn't so far underground. It isn't. I came into the lobby and got the bend. <laughs> And then I kept walking downstairs until I was stopped by John L. Lewis. Mr. Lewis put a lamp on my head and said, it's okay for two weeks. Well, I'm glad he put the lamp on because that's the first bright thing to come from your head in years. <laughs> the last pack was for Maria Cooper. Do you hear that, Maria? Go ahead. And now, Fred, while we're discussing this, let's have a bite to eat. I'll call room service. Hello, room service, please. Hello, room service? Please send down two Acme Plaza special dinners. Right away, please. Thank you. Now, Fred, look, why can't I appear on your program this Sunday night instead of next? Well, I'm sorry, Jack, but I have my guest star for this week. He's your band leader. You mean Phil Harris, Shoe Fly Pie, and Apple Pan Rowdy? <laughs> yes, you see, Jack, around this time of the year, Maestro Al Goodman begins to worry about his options. So I thought I'd bring Harris over tonight and give Mr. Goodman confidence. I see, but I better warn you about rehearsing. I better warn you about rehearsing Phil. He'll have to memorize his script. You mean Mr. Harris can't read? Only the labels on bottles. <laughs> When he graduated from school, everybody else got diplomas. He got a sheepskin corkscrew. Well, look, Jack. Don't stop me, I'm rolling. Or I thought I was when we rolled it. Now, go ahead. Rolling? How can a square roll? Look, if you, there's going to be a knock on the door, or I'd answer that. Thank you. Come in. Well, here's room service with our dinner. What's on the menu tonight? Little Indian, little Indian, must have down top. Just the way you like it. Hot dog. Yes, Coney Island Crepe Suzette. Uh, two hot dogs, please. Grupple for peace, coming up. Uh, would you like them Senator Claghorn style? Senator Claghorn style? What's that? They keep repeating on you. <laughs> no, just give them to us plain. How much are they? Well, now, this one is 10 cents, and this one is 8 cents. Well, why is this one only 8 cents? I already took a bite out of it. <laughs> and why didn't you finish it? Taste it. <laughs> Never mind. Here's your money. Uh, thank you. People in the middle and the mustard on top. Just the way you like it, and the Well, Fred, here's your hot dog. Thank you. It was nice of you to keep the eight-cent one for yourself. And thanks for the lemonade, too. Well, Jack, I've got to run along now. I'll see you on my program next Sunday. Uh, wait a minute. We haven't discussed money. How much are you going to pay me? Well, now, let's see. The union scale for the average radio actor is $67.50. What? However, you're the star of your own radio program. That would bring it up to $69.75. Now, look. Of course, you're from California, and you're not as well known here in the East. That brings it down to $68. Wait a minute. Are you forgotten I'm in picture. Oh, yes. That brings it down to 4760. Now, Fred, we'll have to hire three people to start your applause. I'll furnish them. And the guy that yells, you'll be sorry, gets $15. Now, you know. Fred, I'm not going You'd to... better think fast, Benny. That singing dog just had pups, and I can get a quartet of Cocker Spaniels for nothing. Okay, I'll take it. I'll be on your program next week. Not so loud. I don't want to lose my listeners. You lost the line already. So, uh, <laughs> 
Now, you delicatessen Taranty, you've got less listeners than the Siamese twins with one of them out of town. What are you talking about? I've got more listeners than you have hair in your bureau drawer. <laughs> Why, you nasal nitwit, I wouldn't work on your program. It was the last... Twenty-five dollars, take it or leave it. What time is rehearsal? Two o'clock, Sunday, and goodbye. And chiseling me down like that. If it wasn't money, I'd refuse it. Jack will be back in just a minute. The first here is my good friend, Henry Booth. At 40, say an audible, an audible, an 49, American. Remember this all important fact. In a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Yes, it takes fine tobacco to make a fine cigarette. And year in, year out, at market after market, the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy that fine, that light, that naturally mild tobacco. And this light, fine, naturally mild Lucky Strike tobacco means more real deep down smoking enjoyment for you. Remember, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. The famous tobacco auctioneers heard on tonight's program are Mr. F.E. Boone of Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, 49, 49, American. I'm uh, Mr. L.A. Speed Riggs of Goldsboro, North Carolina. American. And this is Basil Risedale speaking for the makers of Lucky Strike. <laughs> L.S.M.F.T. L.S.M.F.T. L-S-M-F-T. Common sense will tell you that in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So for your own real deep down smoking enjoyment, smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. Hello? Say, boss, will you need me during the evenings next week? I don't think so. Why? I got a chance to do a little extra work at the Zanzibar nightclub starting Tuesday. Oh, the Zanzibar. You signed that contract, eh? Uh Uh-huh. Did you speak to them like I told you to? Yeah, but I'm sorry, boss. They want me to work alone. Oh, oh. Well, we'll be down to see you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good night, folks. Jack Benny program, May 19th of 1946. Rochester is on uh, on that show, as you heard. Jack uh, guest uh, was Fred Allen. I love those two guys, F.E. Boone of Lexington, Kentucky, and L.A. Speed Riggs. When we were kids listening to this stuff, all we could do would be to try to imitate those guys. You can... <laughs> Oh, boy. Rochester, by the way, is on the um, uh, Memory Club screen tonight in the community room at Northwest Federal Saving. He's in the movie Love Thy Neighbor with Jack Benny and Fred Allen. It's a 1940 picture, and it's uh, going to kick off our uh, 1977 fall season of Memory Club movies after a a two-month hiatus in the summer. We're back and raring to go for a good uh, season of good old movies. I can hardly wait to get there this evening. After we wrap up here, we'll go out, get a little something to eat, and then meet you at the Memory Club. Doors open at 7.30. Movie begins at 8 o'clock. Dues are a dollar and a quarter a meeting. The Memory Club is held in the community room at Northwest Federal Savings, 4901 West Irving Park Road in Chicago. If you're driving over, there's plenty of free parking in the large lot at the rear of the office on Dakin Street, or you can take CTA transportation right to the door. Fred Allen and Jack Benny continue their famous radio feud on the silver screen tonight in the Memory Club film Love Thy Neighbor from 1940. Also in the film, you'll find the Mary Martin singing My Heart Belongs to Daddy. And the Mary Max are there, too. If you ever wondered what the Mary Max looked like, you'll be able to see them tonight on the screen in the Memory Club. A good evening ahead of us in the Memory Club tonight in the community room at Northwest Federal Savings on Irving Park Road. Memory Club movies are listed in advance in our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. Our Saturday afternoon broadcast schedule is there plus articles from and about the good old days. If you would like to subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Guide, all you have to do is call us at 545-2260. A one-year subscription, 10 issues, is only $7. Why don't you call us now? 545-2260. We'll begin your subscription with the current September issue. We'll mail it out at the beginning of the week right away and include an invoice along with your first copy. 545-2260. 
If you like, send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But if it's easier, just give us a buzz now at 545-2260. Hi, Carmelita Pope from Magicist. Are you aware that regardless of where you live in Chicagoland or suburbs, you're only a phone call away from the finest professional cleaning? Call Magicist for carpet cleaning in your home or office. Or call Magicist to pick up, clean, and deliver your rugs and drapes. So from Waukegan to Joliet, or from Lakeshore Drive to Schaumburg, you're only a phone call away from Magicist. Come clean now and receive a 16-ounce bottle of Sparkle Glass Cleaner with Sprayer at no extra charge. Sparkle is a non-streaking, heavy-duty glass cleaner. Why just clean your windows when you can sparkle them? Call Magicist. Chicago phones 378-8600. Suburbs see the white pages. Bank cards welcome. And remember, Magicist sells rugs, too. Skokie Area Direct Line is uh, 674-4514. The Evanston Area Direct Line is 869-4600. Also, ask about Magicist soil retardant, only three cents per square foot. Continuing now, this is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. Uh, this afternoon, it's Fred Allen and Jack Benny all the way. And now we're going all the way with one of the funniest of the, of the Jack Benny, Fred Allen radio appearances. This is from the Fred Allen Show of May 26th of 1946. This is the, uh, the show where uh, Jack Benny, well, let's see, I think we ought to play it instead of talk about it, huh? Let's have some fun with this segment from the Fred Allen Show. <laughs> That was just a short order of Who Do You Love, I Hope, played by Maestro Al Goodman and his 40 men who... This is Studio 6 hey, wait a minute, folks. wait a this minute. This glass booth is the control room. Say, just a minute. That little man with the mildew on him is a vice president. Say, wait a minute. <laughs> what is this? This is a Radio City 60-cent tour. Okay, folks, let's get going. Hey, wait a minute. I got a stowaway here. A stowaway in a tour? Only 15 people paid. Now I got 16. Who would be low enough to sneak into a tour to save 60 cents? There's the guy. Hey, you. Who, me? Jack Benny. <laughs> Jack, uh, Jack. Come on, Jack. Jack. I'm going to get 60 cents out of you. Take to your get... hand off my spine. Put me down. Yes, guy. Put Mr. Benny down. I'll give you the 60 cents. Wait a minute, Fred. Wait a minute. Put that money away. But, Jack, I've only seen half the tour. Well, Jack... <laughs> give him 30 cents. Here you are, guy. Thanks. Follow me, folks. Now, on your right is a water cooler. <laughs> but, Fred, it was nice of you to pay that 30 cents. Oh, it was nothing. Nothing, he says. 30 cents. Jack, how can you be so cheap? All right, go ahead. Be like the other radio comedians. Tell some cheap jokes. Say I'm tighter than the skin on Sidney Greenstreet's hip. <laughs> I squeeze a nickel so hard the E pluribus laps over the unum. Tell him. Tell him. Well, Jack, I didn't... Oh, start insulting me after I made a, st a special trip up here just to say goodbye before I leave for Hollywood. Well, Jack, I... All didn't... of a sudden, I'm cheap. I won't even eat in the sun. My shadow might ask me for a bite. <laughs> Your shadow has teeth? <laughs> Jack, I look... Jack, don't... Jack, don't get excited. Look, if you're cheap, you're cheap. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> Some people save asparagus ends. It's a hobby. My hobby is not spending. <laughs> well, Jack, if there ever was a time that you and I should not argue, this is the time. What do you mean, this is the time? Well, a lot of, haven't you heard? A lot of the radio programs that have been on, been on for many years have been canceled. They're, they'll not be back on the air next fall. Well, that's radio, Fred. It's dog eat dog. I always say, only the fit survive. Oh, how true. By the way, you, uh, you finished tonight, didn't you? <laughs> yes, sir. Tonight was my last show of the season. Did your sponsor mention anything about your program coming uh, back in October? Well, no, no, Fred, but we have a mutual understanding. You see, we always sort of take it for granted. Oh. The season ends, the sponsor shakes hands with me, and then we... 
Yike! <laughs> Jack. Jack, what's, what's wrong? Tonight he didn't shake hands. <laughs> well, that's what happened to the street singer. <laughs> At the end of the year, his sponsor used to wink. One year he didn't wink, the street singer was back in the street. But Fred, why should my sponsor want to get rid of me? Well, I'm funnier than I was when I started, and I'm getting less money. Really? Some weeks when he's short, I take tobacco. <laughs> I hate to well, get that... these big laughs on your program. I... <laughs> Let's face it, Jack. Radio needs new blood. Who knows? We, we, we may be through. I've been on radio 14 years. They can't throw me aside like an old shoe. But, Jack... 14 years. And now, like an old shoe. But, Jack, you with that hmm and yipe, 14 years is a long time. Fred, what has Mark Perkins got that I haven't got? Only longer commercials. That's all. Well, Jack, you know how it is in radio. Today you're a star. Tomorrow, Ralph Edwards is hitting you in the face with a pie. Like an old shoe. Well, cheer up, Jack. At least we have our memories. We've known each other for 30 years. Yep. The first time I met you, Fred, I was just a kid in school. A diller, a dollar, a 10 o'clock scholar. You were the only 10 o'clock scholar I ever saw with 5 o'clock shadow. <laughs> How I could use some of that fuzz today. <laughs> I could use a good joke today, too. <laughs> the next time we met, we were in Vaudeville, remember? You were doing a musical act. Playing the violin. What a finish I had. When I played Glowworm, my violin lit up. <laughs> With those neon strings, it was beautiful. Fred, remember my encore? Encore? Remember I'd put the violin bow in my teeth, bend the crab, and play Listen to the Mockingbird? And as you bent the crab, two mockingbirds flew out of the back of your pants. I stopped every show. Uh, <laughs> except this one. Remember the closing... Remember the closing... This one stopped five minutes before I got on it. Cash Daily. <laughs> remember, remember that week in Needles, Arizona, the closing act, Cohen's Camels. Cohen's? No, no, the I The closing don't. act. Jack, how could you forget Cohen's Camels? Cohen, I remember. My sponsor told me to forget that other word. <laughs> ah, those were the happy days. The next time I saw you, you were just going into radio. Radio. I remember the morning Marconi called me up. <laughs> Marconi? Marconi and Singing Sam had a little radio station in a doorway down on the east side. The antenna was a Western Union boy holding a wire. Well, I guess it's... Those jokes don't fit. No, they don't. don't. (laughs) The antenna. When did I ever say antenna on my own show? (laughs) Go ahead, Fred. Well, it's all over, Jack. We've come to the end of the rainbow. Like an old shoe. Like There it is again. (laughs) And on ten minutes already, I've only had it for an old shoe. Oh, I forgot antenna. Yeah. You ought to get a boot out of that old shoe by now. No, I'm sorry I brought it back in again. It seems like only yesterday I ran into the May Company and said, Mary, stop demonstrating that Brillo. That's another word I don't know. It goes We're on top to of work. an antenna. A Brillo fits on an antenna. Cheer up, Jack. When, you re- when you're retired, you can tune in on my program. Your program? You mean you're not getting thrown out of radio, too? Well, why should I? Listen, if my program is old stuff, you with that broken-down Alan's Alley... Now, well, wait, I mean my new show. New show? Uh, people don't want entertainment today. A radio show has to give away things. Nylons, iceboxes, automobiles. You mean to stay on the air, you have to give things away? Free? Yes. <laughs> I'll die first. <laughs> Well, not me. I'm auditioning my new program tonight. And you're, Fred, you're giving things away? Tons of stuff. To strangers? What's the difference who gets it? Well, Fred, as long as I'm here in the studio... No, I'm sorry, Jack. Professional... (laughs) Professional people cannot participate. It's a rule. But don't you ever find people on these programs changing their names to... We do catch a phony, but we're on the air. What can we do? Nothing. You, You have to give them... The merchandise? That's right. Hmm. Now, Mr. Allen, we're ready for your audition. I'll run along, Fred. So long. So long, Jack. Hmm. Giving away things for nothing. 
Well, all right, Mr. Goodman, let's try out my new show. How would you like to be king for a day? <laughs> and here he is, the man who will change one of you nobodies into king for a day, the old kingmaker himself, Red Allen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And good evening. Did all you folks in the audience like those $1,000 bills you found on your seats when you came in? Good. And if you want more, there'll be a big bag of money at the door. <laughs> On your way out, help yourselves. But the stage is loaded with hundreds of presents for the first man to answer our jumbo jackpot question. He will be king for a day. And here is our first eager contestant. Good evening, sir. What is your name? Myron Proudfoot. <laughs> <laughs> Myron Proudfoot? You look like a chap I know. I'm not interested in your friends. Start giving things away, brother. <laughs> What is your occupation, Mr. Proudfoot? I'm a chaplain in a bakery. What does a chaplain do in a bakery? I put wings on angel cake. <laughs> How long have you been in the cake business, Mr. Proudfoot? Long enough to know a crumb when I see one. <laughs> when I see one. Now, don't get sarcastic, Mr. Proudleg. The name is Proudfoot, and make with the question. All right. Who is the sixth president of the United States? John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams is correct. And Mr. Myron Proudfoot is king for a day. <laughs> Folks, here he is, King Proudfoot. Well, Your Majesty, how do you feel? Never mind how I feel. What do I get? Well, first... First, for His Majesty from Schnook Sport Nook, a genuine nose splash, beaver board, canoe paddle. Here's... A canoe paddle? Oh, boy! And with the compliments of Tiffany's, this chromium pitchfork. Gee, a four-pronger, and it's all mine. <laughs> and from Hemingway's hardware store, 200 pounds of self-hardening putty for King for a day. Just what I needed. Just what I needed. This is just the beginning, King. King, you are over 35. By two years. Fine. That jumbo card in Uncle Jim for His Majesty. He is over... <laughs> Epi, Epi, that's well, yipe, backward. <laughs> and here, the piston rod from a genuine Baldwin locomotive, or His Majesty the King. <laughs> a small locomotive. <laughs> and here, from Melody Lane Music Shop, this case of 2,000 soybean mandolin picks. These are the mandolins. <laughs> I just keep pinching myself to believe it. Immediately after this program, Your Majesty will be guest of honor at a banquet at Hamburger Heaven. <laughs> through the courtesy of the sanitation department, you will be guest conductor on the 11-5 garbage run through the Bronx. <laughs> At night, in your ermine robe, you will be whisked by bicycle to Orange, New Jersey, where you will be the judge in a chicken cleaning contest. <laughs> I'm king for a day! And that's not all! Yes, we are going to start right now to make you look like a king. Sam of Sam's Super Shoe Shine Stand is here to brush your shoes. All right, Sam. Sam, watch out for the buttons. Next, the president of the Busy Bee Hat Cleaners is here to block your hat. Take the king's hat, Mr. Bumble. And change the newspaper and the hat band. <laughs> your suit is a little baggy, king. Boys, take his majesty's coat off. Wait, wait, wait. On our stage, we have a Hoffman pressing machine. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. An expert operating the Hoffman pressing machine will press your trousers. Now, wait a For 15 years, I've been waiting to catch you like Alan, this. Alan, you haven't seen the end of me. It won't be long now. I want my pay. Well, if you don't know what day today is... <laughs> today is the day to get out the tall grasses. The iced tea season is here. Time to enjoy iced tender leaf tea, one of summer's main attractions. Yes, iced tea is raised to its ultimate best by the use of this richer blend. In fact, the iced tea season has played a big part in making tender leaf tea so famous for flavor. Flavor means more. It's more important through the summer months. So everybody sets out to get all the flavor going, and that leads straight to tender leaf tea for finer flavor and more of it. 
In spite of melting ice, the rich are good as a tender leaf cheap assist. The last swallow of the glass is still delicious, still flavorful tender leaf tea. This comes is up, NBC, the, the national broadcasting company. And there, they did it again, Fred Allen running out of time. Well, you could certainly hear why with a tremendous audience response to that. They really did de-pants Jack Benny there on the stage. <laughs> Fred Allen and Jack Benny, absolute geniuses of comedy. How great they were. Now, don't touch that dial because we have something very special coming up in just a moment. That, incidentally, that little uh, segment there was from the... Uh, Fred Allen Show of the 26th of May, 1946. That complete show, by the way, is available on a cassette tape that you can pick up uh, at our Metro Golden Memory Shop. Speaking of that, also at the MGM Shop, you can pick up the uh, the brand new book by Chuck Voldarsic called A Complete Photo History of Riverview from 1904 to 1967. Gone but not forgotten. It's the story of the world's largest amusement park. It's a big 8.5 by 11 a uh, soft cover book, over 100 pages, hundreds of photos, tickets, blueprints of the park rides, memories of the 64 years of Riverview Park. The book sells for $9.95. We have them in stock at our MGM shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road in Chicago. We're open this evening until 7.30, tomorrow from 12 to 5, and Monday through Friday from 11 until 5.30. The author, Chuck Voldarsic, will be joining us tonight in the Memory Club, and you can meet Chuck and have him autograph a copy of his book, which you can purchase at the Memory Club tonight or tomorrow afternoon if you want to pop into our Metro Golden Memory Shop. Chuck Voldarsic will be there tomorrow afternoon, and I'll be there too tomorrow afternoon. And uh, you can pick up your copy of the Riverview Photo History book and get the author to autograph it to you personally if you'd like to do that. So tonight, if you come to the Memory Club, or tomorrow, if you come to the Metro Golden Memory Shop, you can get your uh, Riverview book and have it personally autographed by the author. When most people have something exciting to say, they shout about it. At Northwest Federal Savings, we have gifts so exciting and so great that we don't have to shout them. You see, the brand names behind our gifts are big names, and they do all the shouting. For example, you can get a West Bend saute pan, or a famous Lufkin tape measure, or a Costco folding step stool, and better yet, a rival crock pot, or a Black & Decker circular saw, an Atari TV game. Well, you see what we mean. Those big names can get pretty loud without us doing any shouting at all. And you can get these and any number of other gifts free or for special low prices when you deposit $250 or more at any Northwest Federal Savings Center. But hurry, because we can't keep the noise down forever. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. And offer so good, we don't have to shout about it. Beginning Monday at Northwest Federal Savings. This is Chuck Shaden on our Those Were the Days program on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. This afternoon, we have been listening in to the talents of uh, Fred Allen and Jack Benny, superstars. Jack Benny died on December 26th of 1974. Fred Allen passed away on, on March the 17th of 1956. The next day, Jack Benny delivered a, uh, a very warm-hearted eulogy in behalf of uh, Fred Allen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Benny. Needless to say, particularly to those of you who knew of the association that I've been, I've had with Fred Allen, must know how terribly sad I feel and how shocked I was last night when I got the sad news about his death. Uh, many people have asked me when we had our feud in radio going on for so many years if we were enemies or friends. Well, to have that kind of a feud, you could only be the best of friends. Fred was, Fred and I were very close. And the kind of friendship we had where we didn't have to prove it to each other every minute because we couldn't see each other often. 
he living in New York and my being here. But I would like to just add to this that I feel that I have lost a very, very dear pal. Mary and I both feel that way. And that America has lost one of the great wits of our time, comparable to Will Rogers or anyone else you can mention. I know how clever he was because of my association with him and doing so many programs together. Yet, with all his great wit, he was a serious-minded chap, and whenever we were together, there wasn't, it wasn't just a lot of fun. It was just a lot of good heart-to-heart -heart talk. Uh, I don't know what else to say, except that it'll take some time before I get over this dreadful news. Thank you. Got in from New York. Oh, hello, Mr. Allen. Mr. Benny ain't home either. Yes, I know that. Well, why don't you come on over for dinner, Mr. Allen? Mr. Benny's pet chicken is awful sick. <laughs> his chicken is sick? Uh, what's wrong with it? I'm fine at the desk. Well, Rochester, here's what I called about. Is there any chance of using Mr. Benny's room while he's away? If you say you the rent. I get it. I tell you what, Rochester, I'll take the room, and when Mr. Benny gets home, I'll give him a check for whatever he wants. Give him a check? Well, yes. Yeah. That kind of eliminates the middleman, don't it? <laughs> Well, how about this? I'll give you the check, and you can give it to Mr. Benny. How about this? You give me the cash and let nature take a course. <laughs> well, I don't see why we should be arguing about money, Rochester. After all, you should be glad to have someone around the house. You must be mighty lonesome in that big place there, all alone. All alone? Oh, Mr. Allen, come now. <laughs> Rochester, I hesitate to think what Mr. Benny will say when he gets home. He won't do for radio, will it? <laughs> I'm afraid not. Well, Rochester, I guess I won't uh, get much rest at the house of Benny with all your friends whooping it up around there. I'm inclined to agree. You're so right. So I'll just let the room go. Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye, Mr. Allen. That was a close one. I nearly rented the room, honey. Honey? Rochester, to whom were you just talking? Oh, oh that was my cousin Sylvester, Sylvester J. Honey. Uh, uh, good goodbye, honey. I mean, Miss Allen. Jack Benny and uh, Fred Allen, two of the giants of uh, the world of comedy. Uh, the subject of our uh, program are those with the day's program this afternoon. Uh, the two superstars throughout the afternoon, the great talented men, uh, the sounds of their talents. You can see them in person. Well, uh, I get so involved with this that you can see them in person. Obviously, we can't see them in person, but you can come in person and see them on the screen tonight in the Memory Club in the community room at Northwest Federal Savings. Our movie tonight is Love Thy Neighbor. It's from 1940, and you'll see Jack Benny and Fred Allen carrying on their famous radio feud on the silver screen. Rochester is there to provide more laughs and some musical fun. It's supplied by the Mary Max, and Mary Martin is there, too, to sing My Heart Belongs to Daddy. 
If you would like to see the logical extension of our program this afternoon or of the great Jack Benny and Fred Allen feud, you'll see it tonight in the Memory Club in the community room at Northwest Federal Savings, 4901 West Irving Park Road in Chicago. Plenty of free parking in the lot at the rear of the office, or you can take CTA transportation to the door. Dues are a dollar and a quarter a meeting. You're automatically a member of the Memory Club because you're a member of our listening audience. Doors open at 7.30. Movie begins at 8 o'clock. We hope to see you there tonight. For Fred Allen and Jack Benny on the screen in Love Thy Neighbor. <laughs> Well, that's about it for today. The old clock up on the studio wall says it's time to go for now. We'll be back again next Saturday afternoon from 1 to 5 with more nostalgic sounds. Next Saturday, Al Jolson, Eddie Cantor, and Jimmy Durante, the great ones. We'll have a complete Lux Radio Theater broadcast of The Jazz Singer starring Al Jolson. We're having that as our annual presentation in honor of the Jewish New Year. And to our friends celebrating New Year's this week, a very happy New Year to you from all of us here at our Nostalgia Broadcast Center. We'll also have next Saturday afternoon Eddie Cantor at Carnegie Hall in The Legend of Jimmy Durante. In a couple of weeks, radio in the 1950s and more good stuff as we roll along. Our thanks to Mort Paradise, Dennis Bubaz, Joel Bogart, and Gary Schroeder for their help behind the scenes. To our sponsors, Northwest Federal Savings, Nelson Hirschberg Ford, and Eden's Plaza Shopping Center for making this weekly get-together possible. And to you out there in Radio Land for making it worthwhile. This is Chuck Shaden speaking. Have a nice weekend. I hope that we'll see you tonight in the Memory Club uh, for our Jack Benny Fred Allen film, or if you can't make it there, we'll be at the MGM shop tomorrow afternoon with Chuck Voldarsik. So we'll see you there. Thanks very much for listening. The time in Chicago is 5 p.m. This is WNIB in Chicago at 97 FM, the station for old-time radio and for classical music. And this is Bruce Duffy welcoming you now to Zephyr, a two-hour program of short, familiar classical music which we present every evening beginning at this time. During the first hour of tonight's program, we will have the last in our series of the Beethoven sonatas for violin and piano, tonight the number 10 with Josef Sigeti. Also in this first hour, music of Berlioz, Gounod, Chopin, and Franz Liszt. Then in the second hour, beginning at about 6 p.m., we have some French music to begin with, music of Faure, Massenet, Charpentier, also music of Goddard, Tiernay, and Caprices by Sarasate and Moskowski. To begin, we have the last in a series which we have been running for the last ten days of the Ten Sonatas for Violin and Piano by Beethoven. Tonight we're going to hear the number 10 in G major, Opus 96. In this recording we will hear violinist Josef Sigeti with pianist Arthur Schnabel.